888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. I am Larry Elder. We are ReliefFactor.com studio. And this is Phone and Bro Friday. In the third hour, we will be playing Can You Beat Kirk? This week, the topics are going to be This Week in the News, Sports, Famous Books, Car History, and Mexico. You think you're strong in This Week in the News, Sports, Famous Books, Car History, and Mexico. Then stick around for the third hour. More on this in due course. We'll also be playing Phone and Bro in the third hour. Now, so much to get to. Today, of course, is another day of the impeachment trial. This time, the defense put on videos showing Democrats, as we've been doing on the Larry Elder Show, using the word fight, fight, fight uh, in the way that people use it in politics. As I said before, it's standard political rhetoric. And they put together a video, as we've done, but, but there's a far more extensive, of Democrats challenging the election various years. They challenged the election after George W. Bush won in 2000. They challenged the election again after he got reelected in 2004. They challenged Donald Trump's election in 2016. So the Democrats put together, uh, the Republicans put together a montage showing all of this, and it was quite effective. Here's the montage of the Democrats saying fight. Every single day. One, I, I'm a fighter and I'm relentless, but I'm a fighter and I'm relentless. A fighter and I'm relentless. I will fight like hell. But the way I see it now is that we pick ourselves up and we fight back. That's what I think it's all about. We stand up and we fight back. We do not back down. We do not compromise. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. You can either lie down, you can, you can whimper, you can pull up in a ball, you can decide to move to Canada, or you can stand your ground and fight back. And, and that's what it's about. We, we do fight back, but we are going to fight back. We are not turning this country over to what Donald Trump has sold. We are just not. Look, people are upset and they're right to be upset. Now we can whimper, we can whine, or we can fight back. Me, I'm here to fight back. Sounded like insurrection to me. I'm here to fight back. My goodness, Roberto Duran is trembling. Because we will not forget. We do not want to forget. You're not gonna forget anything. We will and they certainly haven't forgotten how to fight. Use that vision to make sure that we fight harder, we fight tougher, and we fight more passionately for than ever. We still have a fight on our hands. So when they say fight, they just mean passion, energy, commitment to the cause. When Donald Trump says fight, he means burn the place down. Fight hard for the changes Americans are demanding. Get in the fight, to winning the fight, the fight, fighting, he's fighting. We'll use every tool possible to fight for this change. We'll fight, we'll fight, to fight fighting hard. I haven't seen this much fighting since Rocky IV. Are serious about or is it five? Fighting and fight. We gotta get on our front foot and fight back. Problems, we call them out and we fight back. But to be perfectly honest, when Elizabeth Warren says, I'm ready to fight you, are you scared? I'm in this fight. I am fighting. I am fighting. Get in this fight. Like the church lady saying, I'm going to give you a beat down. I mean, you're not really that worried, are you? Get in this fight. Get in this fight. And fighting we all... And the point is, these are senators themselves, the ones who are about ready to vote to convict Donald Trump because of his inflammatory rhetoric. And they've all said the same thing. We need to be in the fight. We all need to stay in the fight. We stay in this fight. We fought back. We fought back. I am not afraid of a fight. I am in this fight all the way. You don't get what you don't fight for. Our fight, our fight. We are in this fight for our lives. This is the fight of our lives. Fight for our lives. Wow. Backs against the wall. But we are going to make sure that this fight does not end tonight. This is a fight for our lives, the lives of our friends and family members and neighbors. It is a fight. It's not just any fight. It's not the undercard. This is the whole thing. Fight, fight. And it is a fight that we're going to work to make sure continues. It's a fight. Kind of raising their voice, too. A little passion there. The crowd yelling and screaming. Do you think they're excited? Fight. 
It is a fight, and that's what this fight is for. Well, I'm wired to fight anyone who isn't doing their job for us. Wired to fight. I'm John Tester, and you're damn right I approve this message. Damn right. Some people just say, I approve the message. I say, damn right I approve this message. Because you know why? Because I want to fight. And I'll have lots of fights ahead of us, and I'm ready to stand up and keep fighting. We have to fight. We're going to fight. We're going to fight. We need to fight, fight, fight. And we need to fight. We're going to fight. We got a few more fights. We're going to take the privilege of a few more fights. And we have the biggest fight of all. I will never stop fighting. I will fight like hell. To she will never stop fighting. Not to sleep, not to eat, not to relieve herself. She's fighting. Fight back against anyone. And these are senators, Democrat senators, same senators who uh, in just a few days are going to vote to convict Donald Trump for using inflammatory rhetoric like saying, go down there and fight like hell. Of course, they're ignoring the peacefully and patriotically. By the way, when these Democrats were saying fight, 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 did they say fight peace peacefully and patriotically the way Donald Trump did? I'm just asking. We need to say loud and clear that we are ready to fight. It's a bare knuckles fight. Now they're bare knuckles, not even going to put gloves on going to have to actually fight back against people the fight has to be conducted it's so important that we need to fight fight that fight we are you getting the impression this is kind of standard political rhetoric have been fighting i was fighting very hard time is of the essence both in terms of the fight i think we should be fighting well i i really believe we need to fight and we're simply not going to take this line down we're going to keep fighting what did jake tapper tell us yesterday sometimes democrats say stupid things that sound violent they're not really violent. They sound violent. When Trump says fight, he means it. When Democrats say it, they sound like they mean it, but they really don't. So I'm telling all my colleagues, this is the fight of our life. Whose side are you on? Who are you fighting for? They're fighting for, I'm fighting. We're both fighting. We will Sometimes you have to know who you're fighting for. Fight back. We're not going to Who you're fighting against. Take this line down. I'm just be helpful with you know who you're fighting against, too keep the fight up what we have to do right now is fight as hard as we can we have to rise up and and fight back and so we're gonna fight and we're gonna continue to fight i am going to be fighting i am like hell we keep fighting 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 or we kept fighting and we did so we're gonna keep fighting we have to be fighting every every uh, single day we have to fight back again these are senate democrats using the very same rhetoric that they're accusing donald trump of employing that caused a quote incitement to resurrection and we have no choice but to do that i think we're doing the right thing to do that uh, fighting and i'm fighting well our job right now is to fight it's really important i'm going to keep fighting i'm asking for the support of people across the country to fight back and you got to be fierce uh in uh, fighting keep fighting brown have been fighting i have told president biden i will fight like mad i'll tell you what now more than ever we have to fight like hell we have these battles on the floor of the senate i'm going to go down and battle and uh, and i'm going to be down there on the floor fighting right. but we democrats are fighting as hard as we can democrats are fighting as you think any of them were embarrassed to hear their very same words thrown back at them probably not hard as we can credit it in any way but we're fighting back what we've got to do is fight in congress fight in the courts fight. because you see donald trump as I said before, was impeached and is being tried for being Donald Trump. One Democrat said, well, for four years, we've been watching his mind. He's being impeached for who he is, for what he is, what he stands for, for having insulted this police politicians, having insulted the media, having called the media fake news, having been unafraid to take on people, having been unafraid to being called a racist. They can't stand it. And he's taught Republicans how to I'm looking for the word. I can't find the word. I think I found the word, Mr. McConnell. Fight. 888-971-SAGE. I am Larry Yeldon. When we come back, they also put together a very a nice little snappy montage of Democrats challenging the election. 2000, 2004, 2016. The same thing that President Trump did. I'm Larry Yelder. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Burka. For an attorney, is there a job? Is there a job more important than this one? I mean, is it more prestigious? 
than to defend an, any president, any president, in a Senate impeachment trial. Bruce, Bruce Castor, again, video cut one, play cut. House managers who spoke earlier were brilliant speakers. And I made some notes, and they'll hear about what I think about some of the things they said later when I'm closing the case. But I thought they were brilliant speakers, and I loved listening to them. And they were smart fellows. Okay, I'm going to get preachy now. Don't ever, if you are in a setting, whether it's a high school debate club or the most important trial of the century, the second impeachment of a president who happens to have left office, don't sing the praises of the other team. How you love listening to them and how great they were. Unless, can you guess? Unless you're better than them. If you're going to crush them with your rhetoric, with your argument, with your evidence, with your style, with your tone, with your delivery, then you can do it. Then you can risk it. Even then, not advisable. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. We already know that tech companies were interfering in the 2020 election significantly. Little did we know there was both private and public pressure to have the tech companies act as political referees to the benefit of Joe Biden and the Democrats. The most interfered with election in American history. Let me say that again. It was the most interfered with election in American history. From the private interests to the tech interests to the changing of how we do voting in this country, it was as if we have, it was the first election in American history because every election before it was done in completely different ways. But these tech companies have incredible influence over Congress. They give millions of dollars through lobbying and direct contributions to be able to dictate the legislative agenda and the regulatory agenda. Remember, President Donald Trump, as one of the last things he did as president, tried to get Section 230 removed as part of the National Defense Bill. Congress wanted nothing to do with it. Would have been a great time to hold these tech companies accountable. In a bizarre and stunning turn of events, if Congress would have repealed Section 230, Facebook could have been sued for not monitoring the violence that these rioters were planning on Facebook. Same with Parler. They're both protected by Section 230. So Congress is now using this as an opportunity to do the tech company's bidding to suffocate Parler. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. The impeachment trial. Hi, Larry. This is Jeff from Flint, Michigan. And I'm calling about uh, the impeachment hearings that are going on. And it's, it's just so disgusting. And I watch these Democrats literally stir up hatred against half of the country. Um, I'm in a Democrat area, and it's turning neighbor against neighbor. And they just, they're not going to stop. Logic has no effect on them. And why, why that is, I don't know. But I think it's time that we start taking our dollars. Uh, companies that are donating to the Democrats, we need to completely stop doing business with them. And we need to seek out companies that love the country and the people of it. And we need to support them because they're not going to survive and we're not going to either if we don't support one another. 
888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. I am Larry Elder. We are ReliefFactor.com studio on this phone bro. Can you beat Kirk Friday? More on that in due course. The caller is right. This impeachment trial, this farce of an, of an impeachment trial, read the Constitution. It says the Supreme Court shall preside over the impeachment of the president. Trump is no longer the president. It is ridiculous. We already know what the outcome is. He's not going to be convicted. The man was exercising his First Amendment right to protest the election, to call the election stolen, as he sees it, just as Hillary has done for four years. A woman who's referred to Donald Trump numerous times as illegitimate. Same thing that was said about the president by John Lewis, so-called good trouble. The conscience of the House marched with MLK. Great deal of moral authority. He referred to President Trump in 2019 as A, racist, and B, illegitimate. Did that cause people to undermine confidence in our election? And the word fight, standard political rhetoric. Trump used it on January 6th. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. Today we will see whether Republicans stand strong for integrity of our elections, but whether or not they stand strong for our country, our country. And, you know, there's still one House race left left to be decided. It's in New York. And the Democrat appears to be ahead by 122 votes, the closest election in, I think, U.S. House history. And guess what the other side now wants? They want an audited recount. And they are complaining that the voting machines malfunctioned, were not working properly, cannot be trusted. Hmm. Who has made the same argument and was accused of engaging in a wait for it conspiracy theory i told you yesterday about a article in the la times my the major newspaper here locally and there was a piece in there by about a woman who hates trump has neighbors who love trump snow neighbors Plowed her driveway. She was shocked. Had no idea that somebody who voted for Donald Trump would be compassionate enough to care about me and plow my driveway. The two things can't exist in the same the same person. Sigh. Reminds me of a story I've told you before. There's a book called Who Really Cares by Arthur, Arthur C. Brooks. When he wrote the book, he was a public policy professor at Syracuse University. He wasn't particularly conservative. He didn't grow up, grow up he said, in a political household. And as a matter of research, he thought he would uh, research uh, who's more generous with their money and with their time, conservatives or liberals. He assumed they would be liberals and did some research and found out nobody had done a comprehensive study to find out one way or the other which, which one is true. So... As an academician, he thought he would do it, and did. And he went over his results over and over and over again because he said they were counterintuitive. It turned out that conservatives were more generous with their time and their money than liberals. And it wasn't just generous with their time as to their own churches or synagogues. They gave time to other causes as well. And when it came to religious versus non-religious households, it wasn't even close. Religious households gave three and a half times more money to charity than did non-religious households. And there are far more religious households on the conservative side than on the liberal side. Wasn't even close. Yet that is what the, uh, the assumption is. So I'm in a barber shop getting my hair cut. It's a barber slash beauty shop. And there is a woman next to me getting her hair done. And I overhear her talking about how selfish she thinks conservatives and Republicans are. And she said it several times, loud enough that I heard it. I don't think she was saying it because she thought 
uh, I, she knew who I was and was trying to provoke something. And I said, excuse me, in a very friendly fashion. I heard you talking about how selfish you think conservatives are. Let me ask you a question. As between conservatives and liberals, who gives more money to charity? And she said, liberals. I said, actually, it's been studied. There's a book, blah, blah, blah. And then she immediately said, oh, well, that's because conservatives have more money. And I said, actually, the average liberal household is wealthier than the average conservative household. And then she changed the subject. Another lady walked in. I said, excuse me, she and I were just talking about this. I want to ask your, your opinion real quickly. As between liberals and conservatives, who is more generous with their money? Who gives more money to charity? She said, liberals. And I said, well, actually, it's been studied. There's a book. And, and she said, well, that's because conservatives have more money. Same thing the other woman said. By the way, the first woman was black. The other one was white. They said the same thing almost verbatim. Didn't know each other. I know this is a small sample size, but this is what people think. And that brings me to a column in the New York Post about a column that didn't run in the New York Times. What? There's a New York Times columnist named Brett Stevens. He was hired recently, in the last couple of years. He's a Trump hater, the kind of Republican that the New York Post, New York Times hires. I went to a speech once where he trashed Donald Trump. I almost got up and walked out. Hates Trump. They hired him. He wrote a piece that the New York Times refused to publish. And somehow, some way, the New York Post published a piece the New York Times refused to publish. And it's about a fired New York Times reporter who used the N-word. Now, how did he use the N-word? Well, he was on a field trip with high school students. In the course of a dinner discussion, he was asked by a student whether a 12-year-old should be suspended by her school for making a video in which she'd use a racial slur. And he said, to understand what was in the video, I asked if she called someone else a slur or whether she was rapping or quoting a book title. And asking the question, I use the slur itself, end of quote. And so they did an investigation. Newspapers said, oh, it's fine. Uh, it's about context. And then 150 Times staffers signed a protest letter saying, under no circumstances, no matter what, should that word be used? The guy's now been fired. And the New York Times put out a statement and said, that word is offensive regardless of intent. And that brings me to the country western star, Morgan Waller. Stick around for that. I'm Larry Elder. Morgan Wallen. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. Parlor, which is still not active. Thanks to a three-pronged attack from the corporatist elite, Amazon, Apple, and Google, they knocked Parler off the face of the earth. Parler is being blamed for not moderating their content ahead of the January 6th tragedy. I saw some of the posts that were put on Parler. Some of them were disgusting and gross. But Parler is a startup company. To put all the pressure on them to monitor everything that was put on their application is completely and totally unfair. But Democrats now want to know their private conversations. They are subpoena. They are subpoenaing. Is that a word? Subpoenaing? Okay. It doesn't flow as nicely. They are issuing subpoenas to Parler, and they are putting a full court press on Parler. They, want, they are even alleging that possibly Parler was bribing Trump because they wanted to give him a part of the company while he was president or after he was president, they were having the conversation. However, new information now shows that Facebook, not Parler, played the largest role in the Capitol Hill riot. New data from the American Department of Justice shows that despite the media and big tech campaign against Parler, it was Facebook which served as the top rallying point for those storming the Capitol building on January the 6th, Forbes reports. This is The Post Millennial by Noah David Alter Toronto. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. What's with these Republicans? I would, I would just, I would just give a dollar and a donut 
to figure out what what's in the mind of somebody like Senator Bill Cassidy. Here's cut five. This is the same guy who was last week, just the other day, on with Meet the Press and Chuck Todd. The, the, the president wasn't there. He wasn't allowed counsel. They didn't amass evidence. In five hours, they kind of judged, and boom, he's impeached. Now, I'm told that under the uh, Watergate, under the Clinton impeachments, mm-hmm. there were truckloads of information. Here, it was a video. Mm-hmm. There was no process. I mean, it's almost like, uh, you know, if it happened in the Soviet Union, you would have called it a show trial. <laughs> That's the guy. That was last week. That's the guy who yesterday voted with the Democrats to proceed with the trial because he didn't like Bruce Castor. And listen, Bruce Castor did a terrible job. President Trump was said to be very angry behind the scenes. Fox News quotes sources as saying Trump was furious and beyond angry over his defense team's showing on day one of his second impeachment trial despite his ultimate acquittal almost certain. The sources who spent time with President Trump said he was particularly incensed with the effort thus far by his attorney, Bruce Castor. Do you get the feeling that the reason he hasn't had a strong showing by his lawyers is because no attorney wants to touch this thing? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. They are claiming that what happened was an insurrection. It's a gigantic lie. Okay. All right. First, I guess, unarmed insurrection where people take selfies at the desks of people they oppose politically. It's the selfie insurrection. All right. So that's the first lie. It, it, it's based on that. If it wasn't an insurrection. Right now you're talking then, about Watson and Schumer making comments and comparing them to what Trump said. And you're trying to say something about what about ism and all that. Did anyone get hurt? By, by the way, for all of you out there, and you know you've had the same experience I've had. Uh, you call these Democrats out for the hypocrisy, and they immediately say, you're engaging in what about it? Somebody taught them that word, so now they cite it like, like lemmings. Lemmings, do lemmings cite things? And um, it's such a ridiculous, stupid thing to say. It's to point out how hypocritical you are. If you think when Donald Trump says fight, it's an incitement to resurrection, insurrection, then what about when other people say it and scream it and yell it? Well, the, nobody got hurt. Did Donald Trump tell people to go hurt people? It's just stupid. I mean, honestly, I, I, I don't like calling people stupid. I really don't. How do you have a conversation like this? This woman gets her, 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 snow, her driveway plowed by Trump supporters. She's shocked? Because you think they're evil? You think they're nasty? You think they're mean people because they pulled the lever for Donald Trump? Therefore, they must be deplorable? How stupid is that? Half the country you think is racist and evil because they voted for Donald Trump? How stupid is that? And the lack of courage on the part of these Republicans to call them out on their hypocrisy and to rip that race card out of their hand. My goodness, Elsie Hastings is in the house. This guy was a federal judge appointed by Jimmy Carter on tape talking about accepting a $150,000 bribe to give mob related defendants easy sentences. He is tried, found not guilty. But because the 11th Circuit felt that he had fabricated evidence, And that he, in fact, had committed the crime. They recommended that the then Democrat-controlled House impeach him. They did. Sent 17 articles of impeachment to the Senate, more than they ever sent for anybody. The Senate approved eight of the articles. He got kicked off the bench. First time in about 100 years. 
plays a race card, runs for office. The man is in the House as we speak. He's on the Rules Committee, voted twice to impeach Donald Trump. Maxine Waters. We played the tape of her yelling and screaming, telling people to push back, get in their faces. Sends a letter to Fidel Castro saying, Mr. President, please don't send back this black woman, former Black Panther who murdered a New Jersey, New Jersey state trooper, broke out of prison, fled to Cuba where she is right now because she's a freedom fighter. The woman remains, not Maxine Waters, but this woman remains on the New, York, New Jersey 10 most wanted list, number one most wanted fugitive. She's in Cuba. Maxine Waters told Castro to keep her there. The same woman, Maxine Waters, that accuses Donald Trump of being in the pocket of Putin. You send a letter to Castro, but Trump's in the pocket of Putin. Putin, please swear that for me. A woman who blames the CIA for essentially starting the cocaine trade in the inner city. And then used her political influence to stop a Houston DEA probe into a suspected cocaine dealer who was a friend of her husband nobody brings it up during the financial crisis she contacts the then secretary of treasury under george w bush henry paulson and gets millions of dollars to bail out minority-owned banks without telling him that she and her husband had a financial interest in one of said minority-owned banks that triggered a house inquiry ethics inquiry It went on forever. She played the race card. It went supernova because the Republicans and Democrats are stupid scared of her. Woman says the riots in 1992 were a rebellion and justify the looting. There are hardworking men and women owning businesses in the inner city. They were looted. She's justifying it. Nobody brings it up. Chuck Schumer introduces a racist scheme in 1974 to get rid of black people. There have to be witnesses. There's a one that wrote an article about it in 2006. Nobody brings it up. Al Sharpton is a kingmaker. All these Democrats from Elizabeth Warren to Beto O'Rourke to Biden kissed his ring during the election. Falsely accused a white man of raping a black teenager. Honestly, nobody brings it up. And then what do they do against you? They pull out the race card. And you don't say a damn thing about Sharpton, a damn thing about any of these other examples. All right. Hundreds of you, my listeners, took my advice and made the switch. If you're with AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, your family could save over 800 bucks a year just by switching to Pure Talk. Same great coverage because they use the same exact towers as one of those big carriers, but you save a fortune. I know because I'm a customer. It is also the top-rated wireless company by Consumer Affairs, the absolute best customer service team based right here in America. And right now, get unlimited talk, text, and 6 gigs of data, all for just 30 bucks a month. And if you go over data, they do not charge you for it. So, from your cell phone, dial pound 250 and say Larry Elder to save 50% off your first month. That's pound 250, say Larry Elder, because Pure Talk is simply smarter wireless. Trending now on The Hugh Hewitt Show. I will not be persuaded where Justice Story wasn't persuaded and where the framers weren't persuaded that they really meant this and they just left it out. I mean, has anyone come up and and approached you with an argument yet that is even remotely plausible other than political? Well, that's a new uh, new way to construct to interpret the Constitution, it's uh, what they left out, not what they put in. Uh, no, I mean, this is this is a made-up process. If this were the impeachment of a president, as you know, it required the Chief Justice to preside. And now we've got Senator Leahy, who is, will be the presiding officer. Presumably, he'll still act as a juror. Uh, Debbie Stabenow, the senator from Michigan, said, well, we're all victims. And then I assume we're, we're all witnesses, too. This is a 
this is uh, Anglo-American jurisprudence turned on its head. Well, I have played your quote today because I think it's important that a condemnation of a pseudo-constitutional process not be confused with applause for what happened on January 6th. I believe the president was reckless right. that day, but that doesn't change the Constitution. And I, do your colleagues across the aisle acknowledge this at all? No, this is a political process. And, um, you know, Hamilton said as much in Federalist 65, as much as we try to analogize this to a, a legal proceeding in a court of law, it's, it's, uh, it's unique. But it's clear that this is part of a continuum. Uh, a lot of the same impeachment managers served on the Judiciary Committee that, that uh, tried uh, President Trump a year ago. And so uh, this has just been a continuum ever since he was sworn into office. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Lon Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. The Biden administration announced in their first week that the U.S. is rejoining the World Health Organization. But the WHO is a flawed group, one that has performed poorly while the world has struggled with COVID-19. Early on, the group was far too deferential to China, even parroting Beijing's early claim that the virus could not be transmitted between humans. Since then, an independent panel concluded that the WHO dithered in its response, waiting too long to declare an international emergency. All the while, the WHO has continued to block Taiwan's participation because of political objections from the Chinese government, despite the fact that the world has much to learn from Taiwan's exceptional response to the virus. Before rejoining the WHO, we should have demanded some accountability and reform from the group for the $400 million in taxpayer dollars we send to it each year. It looks like we'll keep on writing blank checks to the WHO, which they are more than happy. Hi, Larry, this is Richard. I'm listening. I just listened to your last caller who gave the answer of why I didn't understand why the Republicans just wouldn't just walk out, stand shoulder to shoulder at the podium, at the microphone, and tell them we're not going to play your games and we're walking out. Your last caller just answered my question, Larry. So thank you, Larry, for allowing me to leave it a question and then I listen and I get an answer and I'm sorry for hanging up the last time Richard from the San Fernando Valley um, my laundry bell was calling me so I had to go out to the dryer but I would have stayed online and left the message so I want to let Larry know that I heard my answer Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. You got to do what you got to do. Triple eight nine seven one S A G E. Triple eight nine seven one seven two four three. I am Larry Elder. We are relieffactor dot com studio. For those of you who weren't listening to that part of the show, we were talking about why the Republican senators didn't just walk out, and the answer is. The vote would then come down to two thirds of the voting members present. So it would make it even easier for Donald Trump to be convicted uh, if the jurors who are going to vote uh, not guilty walk out. So that's why the Republicans are still there. Triple eight nine seven one S A G E triple eight nine seven one seven two four three is the number. I want to get back to this business of the the left, the Donald Trump haters responding when you say these kinds of things. Well, you're engaging in whataboutism. Shortly after President Trump got elected, Ben Carson, the new head of HUD, gave a speech to his new staff, and he likened slavery, likened slaves to immigrants. I've played you that segment before. He said, in many ways, even though the circumstances were different, slaves are like immigrants in that new country, new culture, blah, blah, blah. Got hammered. Got hammered, especially in the black media. Here, this man is, doesn't know his ethnicity. He is a sellout. He is an Uncle Tom. He is this, he's that. How dare somebody compare a slave to an immigrant, somebody who comes here involuntarily and works involuntarily under brutal conditions to somebody who comes here because he wants to. How? A few days later, article in The Federalist pointing out the dozen times where Barack Obama said the same thing using almost verbatim language. Nobody said squat. How do you explain it? 
Oh, I'm sorry, I'm engaging in whataboutism. Here I am, bringing up an example to, to show my point. I can't do that. It shows you hypocrisy. Selective outrage. Hillary Clinton can parade around for four years and call the election illegitimate and say it was stolen. And nobody say, hey, excuse me, uh, you're giving energy to Donald Trump uh, down the road to say the same thing, so maybe you ought to back. Nobody said anything. You know why? Because they believed it was stolen. 78% of Democrats believe that the Russians interfered, which everybody knows they did and, and has acknowledged, but that they changed the outcome of the election. And Jay Johnson, the then head of the Homeland Security Department under Obama, testified there's no evidence whatsoever. We haven't reached any kind of conclusion that the outcome was changed. We know that no voting tallies were changed. They tried, but they failed. Yet 78% of Democrats, and they get their news from CNN, their feed from Facebook, New York Times, and 78% of Democrats have convinced themselves that but for whatever Russia did, Donald Trump would not be president, even though the intel community has never reached that conclusion. Am I not supposed to bring that up? It says something about your reason and your logic. I said that yesterday about the O.J. Simpson case. How do you respect a bunch of people who look at the same evidence of overwhelming guilt and say the man was was innocent man who was framed? How do you respect somebody like that? How do you respect their judgment, their mentality, their ability to reason? Same thing over here. How do I how do I respect this? You guys use the same rhetoric. Fight, fight, fight. You challenged election in 2000, 2004, 2016, same as Donald Trump did. Right now in New York, the losing Democrat candidate is going to court arguing that Wait for it. Voter suppression, voter machine manipulation, voter machine irregularity. I will take him out tonight, said Maxine Waters, well before this ever happened. And I don't think she was taking about thinking about dinner in a in a movie. This vicious, vicious rhetoric. And this man, New York Times, gets fired. He gets fired because he used the N-word when a student said, should a 12-year-old put together a video with, with an uh, offensive word? And he said, what's the word? He repeats it. And he gets fired, and the managing editor, Dean Bacay, the one who admitted that liberals, as a general rule, do not want to hear thoughtful disagreement, he said that I didn't. At first, they investigated. He said, oh, come on, he had no ma malicious intent. But 150 times staffers, which show that the staffers are more radical than the management, signed a protest letter. Days later, they fired this guy. And in the firing statement, they write this. We do not tolerate racist language regardless of intent. End of quote. Are you kidding me? Regardless of intent? It doesn't matter what you're doing, what you're saying, why you're saying it, to whom you're saying it. Stunning. So these rappers can call each other inward, 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 not a problem. But I guess when a white person says it, regardless of intent, Morgan Wallen, under attack, playlists have dropped him, his record company has suspended him because a neighbor filmed him using the inward. He was drunk. He was yelling it at a friend who's white. So two white guys, one white guy calling the other white guy an N-word. Hasn't that kind of come into the culture now? The N-word is being used like that now? Young people, young rappers do? I don't like it. You don't like it? But he's going to be canceled for this? Regardless of the fact he's talking to another white guy? Actually... Hey, take care of this blank, blank N word, meaning take care of my friend. We're all drunk. Take care of us. Stupid. Dumb. He said he'd been drunk for 72 hours. Regardless of intent. Regardless of intent. Stunning. 
Now, as people get older and struggle with pain, many think there's nothing they can do about it. Well, let me tell you something. The Relief Factor doctors believe that the four key ingredients are four times better than omegas alone. Because getting older, exercise, and just everyday living can cause back, neck, shoulder, hip, or knee pain. If that's true for you, you ought to consider ordering the three-week quick start. Discount it to only $19.95. That's less than a dollar a day to see if we can get you out of pain. After that, we're talking about less than the cost of a cup of coffee a day out of pain. Give your body what it needs to heal itself. Again, only $19.95. ReliefFactor.com, ReliefFactor.com, or call 800-400-8384-800-500-8384-800-500-8384-800-500-8384. This is Albert Moeller for townhall.com. The American experiment is founded upon a presupposition, a prior commitment to an ordered liberty, an established order. That means policies. It means a covenant. In our case, it means a constitution. As of right now, the U.S. Constitution is the longest surviving written constitution in human history. It's a remarkable document. All of that came to the fore in violent events that interrupted the joint session of Congress to count the votes of the Electoral College. At the end of the day, our constitutional order proved itself once again resilient. But that doesn't take away any of the tragedy and the horror of what took place. It was an enormous stress test on ordered liberty, a stress test brought on by the President of the United States. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. It's an opportunity for the right, the left, conservatives, liberals, all Americans to repudiate political violence and reaffirm, once again, our commitment to ordered liberty. It's the American way. I'm Albert Moeller. The Pepperdine School of Public Policy, America's unique graduate program for leaders. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. If you're an attorney, is there a job, is there a job more important than this one? I mean, is it more prestigious than to defend an, any president, any president, in a Senate impeachment trial? Bruce, Bruce Caster, again, video cut one, play cut. House managers who spoke earlier were brilliant speakers. And I made some notes, and they'll hear about what I think about some of the things they said later when I'm closing the case. But I thought they were brilliant speakers, and I loved listening. Sharpton called Cuomo a racist, compared Abrams to Hitler, and said Brawley would go to jail rather than cooperate with the investigators. Maddox would actually say that the attorney general of the state of New York was masturbating over pictures of 15-year-old Tawana Brawley. They looked up and they saw Maddox, Mason and Sharpton. What wrong with them? Triple eight nine seven one S A G E triple eight nine seven one seven two four three. I am Larry Elder. We are relieffactor.com studio. Did the kingmaker, uh, Mr. Sharpton, get canceled for referring to white people as crackers? For referring to the black mayor of New York as an N word whore? For calling Jews diamond merchants? Whites moving into Harlem interlopers? Did he ever get canceled for that? This is just. <sighs> Donald Trump according to one of these Democrats, has a four-year history of inciting people. So you're trying him, not for what he said on January 6th, you're trying him for being him. Can we do that with Mr. Sharpton? Play that same game? Got famous falsely accusing a white man of raping a black teenager, nobody even brings it up? And what I find jaw-dropping, we talked about this yesterday, Joe Scarborough. Believe it or not, Joe Scarborough used to be a Republican congressman from Florida, introduced a resolution blasting Sharpton, talking about all the things I've talked about, about Freddie's Fashion Mart, Google that, about Crown Heights, about calling Jews interlopers and his incendiary language, 
during the 1991 Crown Heights riots. All in this very, very comprehensive resolution full of whereases and whereases and whereases and whereases. And now they sit on the same table, on the same show, sometimes, same network, and Scarborough kisses his butt. Oh, thank you for joining me, Reverend Sharpton. I tell you what, it's just great having you, Reverend Sharpton. It's really wonderful. And nobody brings it up. I've not heard a single Republican remind people that Joe Scarborough once condemned Sharpton as being a racist anti-Semitic and a race card hustling incendiary. And now they kiss each other's you know what. Stunning. Sharpton still has not apologized for falsely accusing a white man of raping a teenager. By the way, it destroyed the white man's marriage. His daughter, who was in elementary school at the time, got taunted. He, of course, said he received death threats. Jury unanimously found Sharpton liable for defamation. And Sharpton put all of his assets in his wife's name, wouldn't pay. Only pay because he ran for president and knew it would be a liability if he didn't, did not have it paid. So a bunch of rich people paid it for him. Nobody brings... Democrat kingmaker! Can you say David Duke? I'm Larry Elder. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. And there's another headline I saw over at Politico that caught my eye. No conservatives shouldn't quit on the GOP. There was a lot of party drama last night involving the freshman congresswoman from Georgia, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and Liz Cheney, the congresswoman from Wyoming. It appears the Republicans have stood by both of them. They're not stripping Marjorie Taylor Greene of being on any committees, and they're not stripping Liz Cheney of her leadership. Rich Lowry writes a pretty compelling piece, and he's not a Trump fan at all. But understand, the fortunes of our political parties, he writes, ebb and flow, and their iterations change over time, but they are robust, deeply embedded institutions of our public life that endure even after electoral disasters and self-sabotaging wrong turns. I mean, there are declarations now that the Republican Party is doomed. A former chair of the Washington State GOP wrote in an op-ed in the Seattle Times, let's form a new Republican Party. There's a CNN headline, should Republicans disband the GOP? The former Republican representative Mickey Edwards wrote an article after January 6th saying he's quitting the party because it has become the opposite of what it was. Rich Lowry observes, this all seems a mite premature about a party that represents, oh, roughly half the country and is on the cusp of a, of a majority in the House, tied 50-50 in the Senate, and in control of the governorships in 27 states, and both the governorship and state legislature in 22 of those. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Albert Moeller for townhall.com. The American experiment is founded upon a presupposition, a prior commitment to an ordered liberty, an established order. That means policies. It means a covenant. In our case, it means a constitution. As of right now, the U.S. Constitution is the longest surviving written constitution in human history. It's a remarkable document. All of that came to the fore in violent events that interrupted the joint session of Congress to count the votes of the Electoral College. At the end of the day, our constitutional order proved itself once again resilient. But that doesn't take away any of the tragedy and the horror of what took place. It was an enormous stress test on ordered liberty, a stress test brought on by the President of the United States. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. 
It's an opportunity for the right, the left, conservatives, liberals, all Americans to repudiate political violence and reaffirm, once again, our commitment to ordered liberty. It's the American way. I'm Albert Moeller. The Pepperdine School of Public Policy, America's unique graduate program for leaders. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. If you're an attorney, is there a job, <laughs> is there a job more important than this one? I mean, is it more prestigious than to defend an, any president, any president, in a Senate impeachment trial? Bruce, Bruce Castor, again, video cut one, play cut. House managers who spoke earlier were brilliant speakers. And I made some notes, and they'll hear about what I think about some of the things they said later when I'm closing the case. But I thought they were brilliant speakers, and I loved listening to them. And they're smart fellows. Okay, I'm going to get preachy now. Don't ever, if you are in a setting, whether it's a high school debate club or the most important trial of the century, the second impeachment of a president who happens to have left office. Don't sing the praises of the other team. How you love listening to them and how great they were. Unless, can you guess? Unless you're better than them. If you're going to crush them with your rhetoric, with your argument, with your evidence, with your style, with your tone, with your delivery. Then you can do it. Then you can risk it. Even then, not advisable. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. We already know that tech companies were interfering in the 2020 election significantly. Little did we know there was both private and public pressure to have the tech companies act as political referees to the benefit of Joe Biden and the Democrats. The most interfered with election in American history. Let me say that again. It was the most interfered with election in American history. From the private interests to the tech interests to the changing of how we do voting in this country. It was as if we have, it was the first election in American history because every election before it was done in completely different ways. But these tech companies have incredible influence over Congress. They give millions of dollars through lobbying and direct contributions to be able to dictate the legislative agenda and the regulatory agenda. Remember, President Donald Trump, as one of the last things he did as president, tried to get Section 230 removed as part of the National Defense Bill. Congress wanted nothing to do with it. Would have been a great time to hold these tech companies accountable. In a bizarre and stunning turn of events, if Congress would have repealed Section 230, Facebook could have been sued for not monitoring the violence that these rioters were planning on Facebook. Same with Parler. They're both protected by Section 230. So Congress is now using this as an opportunity to do the tech company's bidding to suffocate Parler. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show.
888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. I am Larry Elder. We are ReliefFactor.com studio. On this phone and bro, Can You Beat Kirk Friday, we're talking about, of course, the impeachment trial farce. And for Can You Beat Kirk, which we will be playing in the third hour, the categories this week are This Week in the News, Sports, Famous Books, Car History, Mexico. If you think you're strong... In the categories of This Week in the News, Sports, Famous Books, Car, History, and Mexico, you may want to join us in the third hour. More on this in due course. We'll also be playing Phonabro. The defense put on a montage of Democrats using the same rhetoric that uh, President Trump used. This is a fight for our lives, the lives of our friends and family members and neighbors. These are the very same Democrat senators who are sitting in judgment over the president for his use of inflammatory rhetoric that caused an incitement to insurrection. It is a fight, fight, and it is a fight that we're going to work to make sure continues. It's a fight. It is a fight. It is a fight, and that's what this fight is for. Well, I'm wired to fight anyone who isn't doing their job for us. I'm John Tester, and you're damn right I approve this message. And I'll have lots of fights ahead of us, and I'm ready to stand up and keep fighting. We have to fight. We're going to fight. We're going to fight. We need to fight, 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 and we need to fight. We're going to fight. We got a few more fights. I'm going to take the privilege of a few more fights. And we have the biggest fight of all. I will never stop fighting. I will fight like hell to fight back against anyone. We need to say loud and clear that we are ready to fight. It's a bare knuckles fight. And one of the big users of this rhetoric turns out to be the senator from Massachusetts. The way I see it now is that we pick ourselves up and we fight back. That's what I think it's all about. We stand up and we fight back. We do not back down. We do not compromise. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. You can either lie down, you can you can whimper, you can pull up in a ball, you can decide to move to Canada, or you can stand your ground and fight back. And and that's what it's about. We we do fight back, but we are gonna fight back. We are not turning this country over. To what Donald Trump has sold. We are just not. Look, people are upset and they're right to be upset. Now we can whimper, we can whine, or we can fight back. Me, I'm here to fight back. I'm here to fight back because we will not forget. <clears throat> we do not want to forget. We will use that vision to make sure that we fight harder, we fight tougher, and we fight more passionately for than ever. We still have a fight on our hands. Fight hard for the changes Americans are demanding. Get in the fight, to winning the fight, to fight fighting, please fighting. We'll use every tool possible to fight for this change. We'll fight, we'll fight, to fight fighting hard. Serious about fighting and fight. We gotta get on our front foot and fight back. Problems, we call them out and we fight back. I'm in this fight. I am fighting, I am fighting. Get in this fight. And they fight in the streets, you know. And you gotta be fierce uh, in uh, fighting. Fighting. Brown have been fighting. I've told President Biden I will fight like mad. I'll tell you what, now more than ever, we have to fight like hell. We have these battles on the floor of the Senate. I'm going to go down right. and battle, and, uh, and I'm going to be down there on the floor fighting. Right. But we Democrats are fighting as hard as we can. Democrats are fighting as hard as we can. Credit it in any way, but we're fighting back. What we've got to do is fight in Congress, fight in the courts, fight in the streets, fight online, fight at the ballot box. Fighting and pushing uh, around the clock, fighting, continue to be brave and be strong and and keep fighting. We're getting people engaged in the fight. We're fighting. We've got to keep fighting and keep focused. Continue to fight. Fight. Uh, this is going to be a fight. We'll also fight him and challenge him in every way that we can in the Congress, in the courts, and in the streets. Yeah, it's worse than a Notre Dame halftime speech. Trump lawyer also played a video of a bunch of Democrats saying that the election was, saying that their election was stolen. 
if Stacey Abrams doesn't win in Georgia, they stole it. It's clear. It's clear. And I would say, I say that publicly, it's clear. You can run the best campaign. You can even become the nominee. And you can have the election stolen from you. He knows he's an illegitimate president. He knows. He knows that there were a bunch of different reasons why the election turned out the way it did. Votes remain to be counted. There are voices that were waiting to be heard. And I will not concede. Respect and I respect where you're coming from and I respect the, the issues that you're raising. You're not answering the question. Do you think it I was... Am, I, no, do, I, I, would I not it, do you, You're not using the word legitimate. There are still legitimate concerns over the integrity of our elections and of ensuring the principle of one person, one vote. I agree with tens of millions of Americans who are wo very worried that when they cast the ballot on an electronic voting machine, that there is no paper trail to record that vote. But constantly shifting vote tallies in Ohio and malfunctioning electronic machines, which may not have paper receipts, have led to additional loss of confidence by the public. This is their only opportunity to have this debate while the country is listening and it is appropriate to do so. As I mentioned, 2000, 2004, 2016, some or many Democrats challenged the electors, certifying the election. 2004, Stephanie Tubbs Jones is a congresswoman from Cleveland, Ohio, and felt that there was voter manipulation, voter machine malfunction, irregularity, and Barbara Boxer, Senator from New York, uh, from California, joined with her. And Hillary and Obama praised the effort. Now, this is Democrats objecting to the first week of January 2017, the election of Donald Trump. I have an objection because 10 of the 29 electoral votes cast by Florida were cast by electors not lawfully certified. I object to the votes from the state of Wisconsin, which were not, should not be legally no certified. Debate. Or Mr. President, I object to the certificate from the state of Georgia on the grounds that the electoral votes no, were no not... Debate. There's no debate. But when Donald Trump suggested the election was stolen, using the S word, same as Hillary has, well, that's an embracing a conspiracy theory. That's exciting the country into believing BS. And I object to a certificate uh, from the state of North Carolina. I object to the 15 votes from the state of North Carolina. Um, I object. I object to the certificate from the state of Alabama. The electors were not lawfully certified. Is it signed by a senator? Not as of yes, Mr. President. In that case, the objection cannot be entertained. The objection cannot be entertained. The Counting debate is uh, not in order. Ballot. Even with the there is no debate in order. Is it signed by a senator? There is right no debate. And there is no debate by the in the joint government. session. There there's no debate. There's no debate. There's no debate. And the mass please come to order. The objection cannot be received. But the Russian Section 18, Russian Title 3 of the United States Code prohibits debate in the joint session. I do not wish to debate. I wish to ask, is there one United States senator who will join me in this letter? There is no debate. There is no debate. The gentlewoman will suspend. This brings us to Barack Obama, who condemns violent rhetoric. We have heard vulgar and divisive rhetoric aimed at women and minorities, at Americans who don't look like us or pray like us or vote like we do, for it is a cycle that is not an accurate reflection of America. And it has to stop. I don't want the folks who created the mess to do a lot of talking. I want them just to get out of the way so we can clean up the mess. I need you to go out and talk to your friends and talk to your neighbors. I want you to talk to them whether they're independent or whether they are Republican. I want you to argue with them and get in their face. We talk to these folks because they potentially have the best answers, so I know who's to kick. I'm Larry Elder. Now, on the Charlie Kirk Show. Parlor, which is still not active, thanks to a three pronged attack from the corporatist elite, Amazon, Apple, and Google, they knocked Parlor off the face of the earth. Parlor 
is being blamed for not moderating their content ahead of the January 6th tragedy. I saw some of the posts that were put on Parler. Some of them were disgusting and gross. But Parler is a startup company. To put all the pressure on them to monitor everything that was put on their application is completely and totally unfair. But Democrats now want to know their private conversations. They are subpoena. They are subpoenaing. Is that a word? Subpoenaing? Okay. Doesn't flow as nicely. They are issuing subpoenas to Parler. And they are putting a full court press on Parler. They want they are even alleging that possibly Parler was bribing Trump because they wanted to give him a part of the company while he was president or after he was president, they were having the conversation. However, new information now shows that Facebook, not Parler, played the largest role in the Capitol Hill riot. New data from the American Department of Justice shows that despite the media and big tech campaign against Parler, it was Facebook which served as the top rallying point for those storming the Capitol building on January the 6th, Forbes reports. This is The Post Millennial by Noah David Alter Toronto. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. What's with these Republicans? I would, I would, just, I would just give a dollar and a donut to figure out what, what's in the mind of somebody like Senator Bill Cassidy. Here's cut five. This is the same guy who was last week, just the other day, on with Meet the Press and Chuck Todd. The, the, the president wasn't there. He wasn't allowed counsel. They didn't amass evidence. In five hours, they kind of judged and boom, he's impeached. Now, I'm told that under the uh, Watergate, under the Clinton impeachments, mm -hmm. there were truckloads of information. Here, it was a video. Mm -hmm. There was no process. I mean, it's almost like, uh, you know, if it happened in the Soviet Union, you would have called it a show trial. <laughs> That's the guy. That was last week. That's the guy who yesterday voted with the Democrats to proceed with the trial because he didn't like Bruce Castor. And listen, Bruce Castor did a terrible job. President Trump was said to be very angry behind the scenes. Fox News quotes sources as saying Trump was furious and beyond angry over his defense team's showing on day one of his second impeachment trial despite his ultimate acquittal almost certain. The sources who spent time with President Trump said he was particularly incensed with the effort thus far by his attorney, Bruce Castor. Do you get the feeling that the reason he hasn't had a strong showing by his lawyers is because no attorney wants to touch this thing? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. They are claiming that what happened was an insurrection. It's a gigantic lie. Okay. Hey, Larry Elder, this is Sean from Seattle. I just want to let you know, man, I appreciate everything you do, brother. Uh, I first found out about you uh, right around the same time I found out about Candace Owens. I love everything that you two do, and, you know, I think that you really, you guys help uh, people like me, who's a young black man who dares to think different, because we all know that's a great sin nowadays. Anyways, man, keep up the good work. And by the way, I loved Uncle Tom. Triple eight nine seven one S A G E triple eight nine seven one seven two four three. I am Larry Elder. We are relieffactor dot com studio. That call reminds me of the study I've told you about for years that CNN and Time magazine did, and it's important because CNN and Time are big uh, disseminators of news. Study of black teens and white teens, nineteen ninety seven, twenty three years ago. Is racism a major problem in America? And both teens said yes. But then black teens were asked, is racism a big problem, a small problem, or no problem in your own daily life? 
89% of black teens said a small problem or no problem in my own daily life. And this is another part of the study that's not often emphasized. Twice as many blacks as compared to whites said failure to take advantage of available opportunities is a bigger problem than racism. Twice as many black teens said yes to that proposition than white teens. Failure to take advantage of available opportunities, that's verbatim, failure to take advantage of available opportunities is a bigger problem than racism. That's before Obama. Remember Peggy Joseph's crying because Obama was there and and said, uh, uh, if I vote for him, he'll put gas in my car, he'll pay my mortgage. She was just crying. When Obama got elected, Jesse Jackson crying. Now it doesn't mean anything? I've made this point before and I want to make it again. 1966, Martin Luther King on BBC. He says, changes in America in the last two years have surprised me. The responses to the Civil Rights Act has surprised me. Based on the progress I've seen, I think there could be a black president in 40 years. Frankly, I think it could be less than that. There's already black people who are qualified, but I think in 40 years' time, maybe even less. I keep bringing this up because that's what he chose as a symbol of when it's done. To the extent that you can reasonably expect people to be fair, that will show it, said MLK. You have the privacy, the ability to vote for somebody or not to vote for somebody, and no one's going to know. He didn't say... When we have CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, and we have, he didn't say when there'll be college presidents, including of the Ivy League, and we have. I remember when Notre Dame was looking for a coach years ago, and Jesse Jackson said if Notre Dame hired a black coach, it would, quote, change the whole mental construct, close quote, whatever the hell that meant. They did. Every major city in America has or has had a black mayor. Frequently, the head of the city council run by is a black person. Public superintendent of school, black. I lived in Cleveland for 17 years. Mayor, black. Superintendent of school, black. President of the city council, arguably more powerful than the mayor, black for a long time. His name was George Forbes. Who are you going to blame now for the crappy schools? And then what happened? They moved the goalpost. It's no longer a reflection of how fair America can be to vote for somebody competent to become president. No, we have to now deal with income inequality. We have to deal with maldistribution of resources. We have to deal with leveling the playing field. We need to install quotas for females to be members of board of directors. Believe it or not, they've done that in California, effective January 1. January 1. If you are a publicly held corporation based in California, you have to have a certain percentage of your board of directors be female. The kind of crap that they've been doing in Europe for years. We're doing it now in California. This is what these guys do and think. Again, the philosophy is real simple. Their philosophy is, I take care of you. I take care of your family. I take care of your community and you get out of my way. The other philosophy, the philosophy that we embrace, you take care of you. You take care of your community. You take care of your family. I will get out of your way. I'll ensure equal protection, equal rights, but I will not interfere. Fundamentally, two different philosophies. I think I said this yesterday. I rewatched the other day the 1960 debate between Kennedy and Nixon. First time presidential debates were televised. There were three of them. And the differences between the two politicians were minute. There were no grave differences on taxes. No grave differences on spending. No difference at all about foreign policy. If anything, Kennedy felt that Nixon was too soft. 
Now the debates are night and day. Reparations? Climate change? Stopping oil and gas drilling? $15 minimum wage? Free community college? Debt forgiveness? And they want to bring back race-based preferences in California, having gotten rid of it years ago. And one of the reasons they got rid of it is because it turned out that when you artificially put a student on campus, that he or she cannot survive on because of their lack of preparation, lack of background, because of the quality of their school, K-12, through they're going to get their butt kicked. They drop out, and I saw it. And what happens is throughout the semester, they get increasingly angry at the professors, at the school, at the world, because they can't figure out why the hell am I here and I can't do the work. And the answer is you shouldn't be there in the first place. You would have been perfectly fine at a less competitive university where the pace isn't fast, isn't as fast, or where they don't expect you to know as much as when you walk in. Eventually, you'll ca- catch up with you. You're going to get your butt kicked right here. That's like jumping into the ring with Muhammad Ali having had a few amateur fights. You're going to get killed. And you have no idea what happened. Now, I want to invite you to an exclusive chance to spend some quality time with me. Thursday, February 18th, we're going to have an Ask Me Anything session. First 20 people, get your tickets today. AskMeAnythingEvents.com for all the details and to secure your spot for February 18th. AskMeAnythingEventsPlural.com. Now, when we come back. I want to get back to this country western star who's being canceled because he used the N-word when he was drunk yelling it at a friend, a white friend. Both of them are white. How many times have you been somewhere and you heard a black person refer to another black person by the N-word? Remember what happened to me when I was in the mall? Mostly white people in the mall. These two uh, teenagers are running around. Now, I shouldn't take teenagers. They look like 12, 13 years old maybe. Hey, N-word, come back here. Hey, N-word, come back here. Good thing they didn't have a record deal. It would have been canceled, huh? I'm Larry Elder. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. They equate believing that the election was illegitimate with treason and uh, uh, and being an insurrectionist and so on. I don't, I don't care what you believe. I don't care what my side believes or your side believes. I care the way people act. How many Democrats believe that the election was not uh, was not stolen from Hillary Clinton? The whole point of the Russian collusion lie was to prove that it was an illegitimate election. Putin won. Remember Putin, not Trump. Telling all Americans over and over and over police are racist does not lead to fatal riots. The burning down of businesses and, and police cars, that, that does not lead to that. The, this is a cover-up for the violence of the left. That's the way it should be regarded. I wish we had the male-female hour today. I apologize to you. I apologize to me. I apologize to males and females listening. I cannot control the events outside. I can only control how I react. And this is a time of crisis wherein my normal programming is deferred. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. The reason that I am having trouble with the with the argument is the American people just spoke and they just changed administrations. So in the light most favorable to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle here, their system works. 
the people are smart enough in the light most favorable to them. They're smart enough to pick a new administration if they don't like the old one. And they just did. And he's down there at Pennsylvania Avenue now. Um, if you were wondering, that's not the White House legal counsel. Just in case you were wondering, that person, whether you say, oh, the American people are so wise they chose Joe Biden. Allegedly, that's Bruce Castor, who, according to reports, works for the 45th president of the United States. Why he spent time on that argument yesterday? Your job is not to praise the last election. It's to deal with the charge of incitement to insurrection. Now, I looked at this guy's bio. He has a, you know, he was a prosecutor in Pennsylvania, put some very bad people away, including murderers. But what happened to him? Again, from yesterday, this is Bruce Castor talking about one of our founding fathers. Video cut two. Play cut. Paraphrasing the, the, the famous quote from Benjamin Franklin, who, as a Philadelphian, I feel as though I can, I can do that because uh, he's a my founding father, too. He's a my founding Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Eric Metaxas Show. But, but if you have Republicans who themselves are unwilling. Hi, Larry. Um, my name is Lee. Uh, I think you're doing a great job. I think this is um, one of the best radio shows I've ever heard since Lee out live uh, in Colorado. So thank you very much for what you're doing. And you're doing a great job. And you keep giving us this information. All right. You have a good night, sir. Triple eight nine seven one S A G E triple eight nine seven one seven two four three. I am Larry Elder. We are relieffective.com studio. This is uh, the weekend. They perform during the halftime of Super Bowl. So I'm hearing there's a weekend going to perform at the Super Bowl, and the guy comes out. And I said, "Okay, where's the group?" So one guy calls himself the Weekend. Is his last name Weekend? His first name the? Is there Mister Mister Weekend somewhere? What what is that? Anyway, is that wishy washy music? Doesn't it sound like elevator music. Can you play a little bit more, Mr. McConnell? Sounds really wishy-washy. Really? I can't feel my face when I'm with you? Use your hands. Um... I, I don't want to, you know, that's, that's, I'm not in his demo. He's not in my demo. So who cares what I think? I'm sure he's not worried about it. But that's his voice? I bet he couldn't even tell you who Marvin Jr. was. You guys don't know Marvin Jr.? They used to call him Iron Throat. Teddy Pendergrass, please. The Great Dells, Marvin Jr. Please. Now, we're talking about the rhetoric that President Trump got impeached for for incitement to insurrection. Katrina Pearson on the Jake Tapper show on CNN, which I watched so you don't have to, brought up when Obama said, you bring a knife, we bring a gun, yada, blah, etc. If we want to talk about inciting violence, where is the interview with Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama when they're talking about bringing a gun to a knife fight, when they're inciting violence against police officers? To well, I mean, the line from the untouchables about bringing a... A, a gun to a knife fight. I think uh, people recognize that that was a, a, an allusion to a. I don't Sean think Conner. so. I didn't. I didn't recognize that. Okay. Absolutely well, not. you should check out the film, The Untouchables. So, if you quote a film, you're no longer engaging in violent rhetoric because you're quoting a film. By the way, Jake Tapper, Jake Tapper also, also misquoted the film. He said, "Bring a gun to a knife fight." It's the other way around. 
If we want to talk about inciting violence, where is the interview with Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama when they're talking about bringing a gun to a knife fight, when they're inciting violence against police officers? To well, I mean, the line from the Untouchables about bringing a, a, a gun to a knife fight, I think uh, people <laughs> recognize that that was a, a, an allusion to a I don't think He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago Here's what Mr. Obama said, June 13, 2008, quote, in Philadelphia, Joe Frazier territory, where they got that statue of Rocky up there in the Philadelphia Museum. They should have Joe Frazier, but that's behind another, another issue. They have a movie star who played a boxer uh, in front of the Philadelphia Museum, a real guy who made his living in Philadelphia, Joe Frazier, who became a Heavyweight champion, he doesn't have his statue in front of the Philadelphia Museum. I'm just saying. Obama, 2008, June 13, Philadelphia. Quote, they're going to try to scare people. They're going to try to say that Obama is a scary guy. If they bring a knife to the fight, we bring a gun. Because what I understand, folks, because from what I understand, folks in Philly like a good brawl. I've seen Eagles fans, end of quote. But he didn't really mean anything for it because, after all, he's, it's just Obama. But uh, Democrats. <sighs> See, um, the defense team also played this montage. To continue fighting, we each have an important role to play in fighting. In this fight, like so many before it, it has been a fight. The American people are going to have to fight and about the importance of fighting. I will always fight. Fighting. But we always must fight. Joe Biden has a deep, deep-seated commitment to fight and to fight and about the importance of fighting. But we always must fight to fight to fight and to fight as our willingness to fight continued the fight as joe biden says to fight it's about fighting of what we're fighting for we will tell them about what we did to fight truly really about um a fight but truly i do believe that we're in a fight i believe that we are in a fight i believe we are in a fight i believe we are in a this whole thing is just a joke she once called joe biden her boss racist and once said she believed Tara Reid, who made the allegation that Joe Biden had committed sexual assault. <laughs> but oh, that's forgotten. Donald Trump. Donald Trump's a cancer. He's got to be gotten rid of. <sighs> now, face it. Getting older exercise can cause pain. Back, shoulder, hip, foot, knee pain. Now, people say they were skeptical at first about relief factor. And then they say they wish they had ordered it a whole lot sooner. Many of my friends and I take relief factor every day. Your first step to becoming pain-free just might be to order the three-week quick start for only $19.95 at relieffactor.com. Relieffactor.com. Over 70% of the people who order it go on to order more or call 800-4-RELIEF. 800-4-RELIEF. Use your hands. Trending now on The Hugh Hewitt Show. I will not be persuaded where Justice Story wasn't persuaded and where the framers weren't persuaded that they really meant this and they just left it out. I mean, has anyone come up and, and approached you with an argument yet that is even remotely plausible other than political? Well, that's a new, uh, new way to construct to interpret the constitution it's uh, what they left out not what they put in um no i mean this is this is a made-up process if this were the impeachment of a president as you know it required the chief justice to preside and now we've got senator Leahy, who is, will be the presiding officer presumably he'll still act as a juror uh debbie stabenow the senator from michigan said well we're all victims and then i assume we're, we're all witnesses too this is a this is a Anglo-American jurisprudence turned on its head. Well, I have played your quote today because I think it's important that a condemnation of a pseudo-constitutional process not be confused with applause for what happened on January 6th. I believe the president was reckless right. that day, but that doesn't change the Constitution. And I, do your colleagues across the aisle acknowledge this at all? 
No, this is a political process. And, um, you know, Hamilton said as much in Federalist 65, as much as we try to analogize this to a, a legal proceeding in a court of law, it's, it's, uh, it's unique. But it's clear that this is part of a continuum. Um, a lot of the same impeachment managers served on the Judiciary Committee that, that uh, tried uh, President Trump a year ago. And so uh, this has just been a continuum ever since he was sworn into office. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Lon Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. The Biden administration announced in their first week that the U.S. is rejoining the World Health Organization. But the WHO is a flawed group, one that has performed poorly while the world has struggled with COVID-19. Early on, the group was far too deferential to China, even parroting Beijing's early claim that the virus could not be transmitted between humans. Since then, an independent panel concluded that the WHO dithered in its response, waiting too long to declare an international emergency. All the while, the WHO has continued to block Taiwan's participation because of political objections from the Chinese government, despite the fact that the world has much to learn from Taiwan's exceptional response to the virus. Before rejoining the WHO, we should have demanded some accountability and reform from the group for the $400 million in taxpayer dollars we send to it each year. It looks like we'll keep on writing blank checks to the WHO, which they are more than happy to keep cashing. I'm Lon He Chen. The Pepperdine School of Public Policy, America's unique graduate program for leaders. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. They equate believing. Hey, Larry, this is Mike. Um, just one thing about the, the infamous, infamous day on January 6th. If uh, Trump, if his goal was indeed to incite a insurrection, Trump is a lousy insurrectionist because he only got, what, a couple hundred people to actually storm the Capitol. So, uh, and, and I think he had over... 500,000 supporters there. So out of 500,000, he was only able to incite 200. Boy, that dude's weak. Yeah, not much of a motivator, is he? 888 sage 888 I am Larry Elder. We are ReliefFactor.com studio. The whole thing, of course, uh, is a farce. The weekend. I can't feel my face. I can't feel my face. Was it soccer? You can't use your hands? Um, Obama, when he became state senator, do you know how he got, got elected? The incumbent wanted to run for Congress. She didn't make the primary. So she, so she decided to, and, and after she decided to run for office uh, for the U.S. Uh, House, Obama announced for her seat. Okay. So then she doesn't win the primary. She says, I want my seat back. She's already sitting in the seat. And Obama does not drop out of the race. She has to file for re-election. They all do. And you have to get a certain number of signatures, even though you're an incumbent. Obama challenged the signatures to the point where she was removed from the ballot. So Obama basically ran unopposed because he challenged the voting integrity of those signatures. Jonathan Turley. At this stage, how do you think it's going? Well, it's going as we expected, and I think your observation is the correct one. Quite frankly, in this strategy, I see more of an effort to enrage than to convict. You know, the, the problem with the House brief and now their arguments is that they're focused on how words were were interpreted, not how they were intended. And what's interesting is that the House members are referring to what some witnesses have said in the media, uh, witnesses close to the president. But they let weeks go by without calling any of these people to lock in their testimony, to call them into an actual hearing, and to create the record they didn't create in the snap impeachment. So the question is, you know, if you're really trying to convict, 
why you have and marshaled that testimony and so that you could present it the way that you were referring to New York Times or CNN uh, statements. Uh, you could actually be using direct testimony. And he also said that the defense was going to show a montage of reckless statements Democrats have made, uh, assuming what you feel Donald Trump said was reckless, and they did. And they also played a video of Jerry Nadler uh, during the impeachment of Bill Clinton saying it was divisive. The effect of impeachment is to overturn the popular will of the voters. We must not overturn an election and remove a president from office except to defend our system of government or our constitutional liberties against the dire threat. And we must not do so without an overwhelming consensus of the American people. There must never be a narrowly voted impeachment or an impeachment supported by one of our major political parties and opposed by the other. Such an impeachment will produce the divisiveness and bitterness in our politics for years to come. I want to remind you, he says he opposes a narrow political impeachment. Zero Republicans join in the first impeachment. Ten in the second and will call into question the very legitimacy of our political institutions. The American people have heard the allegations against the president. Jerry Nadler back in 1992. And they overwhelmingly oppose impeaching him. 1998, rather. They elected President Clinton. They still support him. We have no right to overturn the considered judgment of the American people. Mr. Speaker, the case against the president has not been made. <coughs> there is far from sufficient evidence to support the allegations, and the allegations, even if proven true, do not rise to the level of impeachable offenses. Mr. Speaker, this is clearly a partisan railroad job. The same people who today tell us we must impeach the President for lying under oath, almost to a person voted last year to re-elect the Speaker who had just admitted lying to Congress in an official proceeding. The American people are why- okay, Do you hear that? Just admitted that lying to Congress. I, I have to pause here. Because another of the double standard selective outrage uh, examples is Harry Reid. Harry Reid is on the floor of the Senate during the 2012 election and flat out says the word on the street is that Mitt Romney has not paid taxes in 10 years. Let him prove that he has because he hasn't. It was a lie. And Harry Reid knew it was a lie when he said it. And then when he was comfortably out of office giving an interview with the CNN, kicking back, and he's asked about it, he goes, yeah, yeah, and he was, and she says, do you feel bad about this? And he smugly said, well, Rami didn't win, did he? The ends justifies the means. Did Harry Reid get canceled? He's still alive. He's still the Twitter account. Yeah, I checked it the other day. It's still there. That lie dramatically hurt Romney. I'm not saying it turned the election, but the whole meme was, this is a rich guy who doesn't want to turn over his taxes. Uh, he's playing by a different set of rules. And for and the reporter on, K, on ABC, Jonathan Carl, even said that Romney, compared to an auto mechanic making $75 a year, $75 a year, has a lower federal effective income tax rate than the auto mechanic. It's a lie. If you're comparing apples to apples... Two homeowners, two people who are married, two people who have kids, and therefore take the standard deductions, the auto mechanic's federal effective income tax rate is substantially lower than Romney. Has Jonathan Carl been canceled for that lie that pushed the meme that rich people don't pay taxes? Watching and they will not forget. You may have the votes. You may have the muscle, but you do not have the legitimacy of a national consensus or of a constitutional imperative. This partisan coup d'etat will go down in infamy in the history of this nation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. So these Democrats challenged the election in 2000, challenged the election in 2004, challenged the election in 2016 at the same certification day that Donald Trump did. Did anybody say that they were undermining an election? Overturning an election? Not caring? Now, let's face it. Getting older, exercise, and just everyday living can cause pain. I'm talking about foot, back, knee, neck, shoulder. Have I pointed out a body part that's bothering you? Have you considered the three-week quick start? Only $19 
and 95 cents. That's less than a dollar a day to see if we can get you out of pain. And if we do, after that, we're talking about less than the cost of a cup of coffee a day to stay out of pain. Over 70% of the people who order the three-week quick start go on to order more, suggesting it's effective. Give your body what it needs to heal itself. Four key ingredients, each of which are 100% drug-free. Relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com, or call 800-4-RELIEF, 800-4-RELIEF. This is Lon Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. The Biden administration announced in their first week that the U.S. is rejoining the World Health Organization. But the WHO is a flawed group, one that has performed poorly while the world has struggled with COVID-19. Early on, the group was far too deferential to China, even parroting Beijing's early claim that the virus could not be transmitted between humans. Since then, an independent panel concluded that the WHO dithered in its response, waiting too long to declare an international emergency. All the while, the WHO has continued to block Taiwan's participation because of political objections from the Chinese government, despite the fact that the world has much to learn from Taiwan's exceptional response to the virus. Before rejoining the WHO, we should have demanded some accountability and reform from the group for the $400 million in taxpayer dollars we send to it each year. It looks like we'll keep on writing blank checks to the WHO, which they are more than happy to keep cashing. I'm Lon He Chen. The Pepperdine School of Public Policy, America's unique graduate program for leaders. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. They equate believing that the election was illegitimate with treason and... uh, uh, and being an insurrectionist and so on. I don't don't care what you believe. I don't care what my side believes or your side believes. I care the way people act. How many Democrats believe that the election was uh, was not stolen from Hillary Clinton? The whole point of the Russian collusion lie was to prove that it was an illegitimate election. Putin won. Remember Putin, not Trump. Telling. Hey, Larry, Dano from Arizona here. First, I want to thank you for watching CNN so I don't have to. Second, in the impeachment trial of my president, the Democrats forgot to show all the mothers pushing their children in strollers that had stormed the Capitol building to overturn the election. I saw them in the early videos of the assault that day, Larry. I'm curious why they left these out of their storming on the Capitol building videos. Huh. Also, have you heard back from Small Change yet? I heard him say he watched Uncle Tom, and I was hoping to hear Small Changes. Two cents. Keep up the good fight, Larry. Love you, man. Bye. Small Change didn't tell us that he watched Uncle Tom. By the way, Small Change used to call me all the time when I was at my other station. Uh, I thought he might be dead. I hadn't heard from him in years. And suddenly he calls the other day, leaves a message, small change. I'm live. We're in the same city, 3 to 6, Monday through Friday. Come on. Hello, Deplorable. You mentioned that uh, the inciter-in-chief, the former inciter-in-chief, uh, he said to go peacefully to the Capitol and protest nonviolently in his 70 minutes, uh, you know, BS speech. Do you know how many times he said that? One time. And do you know how many times he used the word fight? 60 times. And we all know that Al Sharpton is a flamethrower, that he stood outside Freddie's Mart and cited a riot and got a number of people killed. But how does that, what does that do? Does that get Trump off the hook? 888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. I am Larry Yoda. So Trump, like Al Sharpton, got in the middle of a landlord-tenant dispute, a black landlord and a Jewish tenant, and turned it into uh, an interracial uh, anti-Semitic thing. That's what Donald Trump just did. Who counts the number of times somebody says fight in a speech? 
seventy minute speech. So he did what? A little more, a little less uh, than one a minute. <laughs> Honestly. Now the reason we played that song, Cocaine, is because I was mentioning the weekend. That was the act that performed during the Super Bowl. Uh, the Weeknd is not a group. It's an individual whose name is The Weeknd. And the song, I Can't Feel My Face, I Can't Feel My Face. Well, uh, the other day I was in an exchange, a Twitter exchange, with a, a young man who writes for a conservative newspaper. And I end my exchange with this. Have a good weekend. And I don't mean the artist who gave the lame halftime show at the Super Bowl. And he responded, you mean our cocaine-fueled savior of social distancing? And I had no idea what he's talking about. So I asked somebody. And they said, I can't feel my face means I've done so much cocaine, my face is now numb. That's a love song? I can't feel my face because I've done so much cocaine, my face is numb and I love you? I love you so much I've done cocaine so I can't feel my face? That's how I express my love? When my face freezes, that means I'm really, really in love. <laughs> I'm really in love now. I can't feel my face because of cocaine? I'm Larry Elder. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. What's with these Republicans? I would, I would just, I would just give a dollar and a donut to figure out what what's in the mind of somebody like Senator Bill Cassidy. Here's cut five. This is the same guy who was last week, just the other day, on with Meet the Press and Chuck Todd. The, the, the president wasn't there. He wasn't allowed counsel. They didn't amass evidence. In five hours, they kind of judged, and boom, he's impeached. Now, I'm told that under the uh, Watergate, under the Clinton impeachments, mm -hmm. there were truckloads of information. Here, it was a video. Mm -hmm. There was no process. I mean, it's almost like, uh, you know, if it happened in the Soviet Union, you would have called it a show trial. That's the guy, that was last week. That's the guy who yesterday voted with the Democrats to proceed with the trial because he didn't like Bruce Castor. And listen, Bruce Castor did a terrible job. President Trump was said to be very angry behind the scenes. Fox News quotes sources as saying Trump was furious and beyond angry over his defense team's showing on day one of his second impeachment trial, despite his ultimate acquittal almost certain. The sources who spent time with President Trump said he was particularly incensed with the effort thus far by his attorney, Bruce Castor. Do you get the feeling that the reason he hasn't had a strong showing by his lawyers is because no attorney wants to touch this thing. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. They are claiming that what happened was an insurrection. It's a gigantic lie. Okay. Right. First, I guess, unarmed insurrection where people take selfies at the desks of people they oppose politically. It's the selfie insurrection. All right. So that's the first lie. It, it, it's based on that. If it wasn't an insurrection, then there's, there's nothing to really talk about. The, the second is that the president incited the insurrection even though they can produce the only thing they could produce is he says you got to fight for what you believe as everybody knows that incites riots the democrats never say fight for what we stand for and it, it just continues along those lines third they equate believing that the election was illegitimate with treason and uh, uh, and being an insurrectionist and so on. I don't, I don't care what you believe. I don't care what my side believes or your side believes. I care the way people act. How many Democrats believe that the 
election was not uh, was not stolen from Hillary Clinton. The whole point of the Russian collusion lie was to prove that it was an illegitimate election. Putin won. Remember, Putin, not Trump. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Uh, Joe Biden gave a really nice speech on on uh, January the twentieth, talking about healing the nation and unity, and appears to be uh, uh, doing none of that during his uh, early early time in office. What do you think is the biggest flaw in the one point nine trillion dollar proposal, Senator? Well, it's just not necessary. Only about 20% of the money that we appropriated in December has even been spent, Hugh. And you can't tell me that a $15 minimum wage is part of a COVID-19 relief package. And it's not as if the the economy really needs more stimulus because uh, we're growing at a rate of about 4% a year. A uh, pretty good clip. In other words, what we've done before has helped. And the American economy, as resilient as it is, is, is coming back. But uh, we do need targeted relief. We need to deploy the vaccine to make sure we get as many shots in arms as we possibly can. And we need to get kids safely back to school. And, of course, uh, we're all watching the battle between the teachers' unions and parents about um, what's happening to our children, which is really uh, uh, tragic. Now, there is also the, the problem that of the, I believe, total $5 trillion at the end of the Biden uh, rescue package. It might be more. None of that money will have gone to defense, Senator Cornyn. So no. we will have done the most incredible thing ever. We will have increased the, the debt to 28 or $29 trillion, and we will not have bought a bullet. Am I right about that? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. This is this has nothing to do with national security or, or uh, defense. And uh, it's all about domestic uh, spending and spending money we don't have, as you point out. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. I want to talk to you about where we are uh, in the culture and in the nation right now. So talk to us. What are you thinking? As you know, I reaffirm my faith in Jesus Christ uh, when I was going through this crucible of being uh, tortured in a politically motivated prosecution by Robert Mueller. Now, I know you missed this, Eric, along with everybody else in the country. But at midnight on Election Day, the busiest news day of the year, the Department of Justice released the last unredacted sections of the Mueller report regarding Roger J. Stone Jr. And you know what they said? They never had any factual evidence whatsoever against me regarding the Russians, Julian Assange, WikiLeaks, stolen emails, John Podesta, nothing. They had nothing. Now, who releases something at midnight? Uh, So in other words, the big uh, media outlets, CNN, MSNBC, The New York Times, The Washington Post, the people who posted headlines blaring that I was a Russian agent, None of them cover this moment. Uh, It gets covered by The Guardian, and it gets covered by BuzzFeed, only because BuzzFeed brought the lawsuit, which required the Justice Department to finally unredact this information. To take it to to modern day terms, um, yes, I was in Washington. I spoke uh, on January 5th. Uh, I actually never left my hotel room at all on January 6th. I wasn't on the ellipse. I didn't march to the Capitol. I wasn't at the Capitol. I was as horrified as every American to see acts of violence there. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. And there's another headline I saw over at Politico that caught my eye.
888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243 on this phone bro Can You Beat Kirk Friday. Speaking of which, we're going to be playing Can You Beat Kirk in our next segment. So we need two contestants. And the categories this week are going to be This Week in the News, Sports, Famous Books, Car History, and Mexico. So if you think that you are proficient in those categories, or in some of those categories, or in one of those categories, and you want to win a copy of A Lot Like Me, the paperback version of Dear Father, Dear Son, the book about my eight-hour conversation with the old man, give us a call at 888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. Again, this week in the news, sports. Famous books, car history, and Mexico. Rather eclectic for an eclectic audience, so give us a call, 888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. I can't let this act of courage go without acknowledgement. There is a singer in Kuwait who's huge. Her stage name is Basma al-Kuwaiti. Known throughout the Arab world. She recently posted a video on Twitter in which she expressed her public pronouncement of her intention to renounce or his or his or her Islamic faith. Wait for it. Pronouncement of her intention to renounce her Islamic faith and to embrace Judaism through conversion. What? According to albawaba.com website, fans and followers are demanding that she be arrested and held accountable for her decision to convert to Judaism. Talk about courage. And the reason she said is that Islam violates women's rights. Islam does not treat women with dignity. And she said, I announce that I am leaving Islam and proudly announce embracing Judaism. End of quote. He says that Judaism embraces women. Unlike Islam. One person commented, quote, this is a sad day for Islam. And it's not her fault. Be interesting to see how she uh, fares. Now, we've been talking about the second impeachment trial farce over Donald Trump saying that he believes the election is stolen, believes there's voter irregularity and so forth. The race in New York, at least as of a few days ago, was still unsettled. The Republican on February 1 began with a 122 vote lead over the incumbent who's a Democrat. And guess what this incumbent is saying? The lawyers are challenging, wait for it, the accuracy of the machine counts. The lawyer said in a filing, quote, in this case, there is reason to believe that voting tabulation machines misread hundreds, if not thousands of valid votes as undervotes, and that these tabulation machine errors disproportionately affected the Democrat, end of quote. Is anybody suggesting that the Democrat is embracing a, 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 a conspiracy theory? A baseless conspiracy theory? Now, there is a actress named Gina Carano. 
She's a Mandal- Mandalorian star. It's a very popular program among young people. She's now been fired by Disney because she posted a tweet that compared the divisiveness in this country, groups pitting pitting against each other in this country, to the way Jews were pitted against Jews by the Nazis, or that's how she said it. Here's what she shared in 2018. Jews were beaten in the streets, not by Nazis, not by Nazi soldiers, but by their neighbors, even by children. Because history is edited, most people today don't realize that to get to the point where Nazi soldiers could easily round up thousands of Jews, the government first made their own neighbors hate them simply for being Jews. How is that any different from hating someone for their political views End of quote, says the post that Gina Carrara put up. Carano put up. And now she's been canned. So you're canned for making a Holocaust Nazi reference. Even though the point she was making, I assume anyway, is that once you have a political view that is considered to be so poisonous, you should be killed. We're in a bad state. That is the point I suspect she's trying to make. Anyway, she gets canned. Now, I've written for years about how frequently Democrats pull out the Nazi card. Have they been canned? Keith Ellison, now the AG of Minnesota, compared George W. Bush and 9-11 to Adolf Hitler and the destruction of the Reichstag, the German parliament building. Quote, 9-11 is the juggernaut in American history, and it allows, it's almost like, you know, the Reichstag fire. After it was burned, they blamed the communists for it and put the leader of the country, Hitler, in a position where he could basically have the authority to do whatever he wanted to. Close quote. And I've told you about the statement made by the then governor of California, Pat Brown, after the nomination of Perry Goldwater, Republican, 1964. Quote, the stench of fascism is in the air. So Disney fires this young lady for her reference. William Clay, whose son is still in the House, Democrat, said of Ronald Reagan. Reagan is, quote, trying to replace the Bill of Rights with fascist precepts lifted verbatim from Mein Kampf, end of quote. There's a piece in Daily Wire, 10 famous liberals who've made the Nazi comparison but weren't canceled. Joe Biden. Trump is sort of like Goebbels. You say the lie long enough, keep repeating it, keep repeating it, keep repeating it, it becomes common knowledge. AOC. Accused President Trump of running concentration camps. Don Lamont. Trump's rhetoric could lead him down the same path as Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler. On and anybody canceled? Joy Reid likened the coverage of Donald Trump to the media's treatment of dictator Adolf Hitler in the 1930s. James Kleinberg said, What Trump is doing is what Hitler did to Germany. On and on and on. But Carano out. Canceled. 888-971-SAGE. I'm Larry Elder. Can you beat Kirk up next? This is Albert Moeller for townhall.com. The American experiment is founded upon a presupposition, a prior commitment to an ordered liberty, an established order. 
That means policies. It means a covenant. In our case, it means a constitution. As of right now, the U.S. Constitution is the longest surviving written constitution in human history. It's a remarkable document. All of that came to the fore in violent events that interrupted the joint session of Congress to count the votes of the Electoral College. At the end of the day, our constitutional order proved itself once again resilient. But that doesn't take away any of the tragedy and the horror of what took place. It was an enormous stress test on ordered liberty, a stress test brought on by the President of the United States. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. It's an opportunity for the right, the left, conservatives, liberals, all Americans to repudiate political violence and reaffirm, once again, our commitment to ordered liberty. It's the American way. I'm Albert Moeller. The Pepperdine School of Public Policy, America's unique graduate program for leaders. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Burka. For an attorney, is there a job? Is there a job more important than this one? I mean, is it more prestigious than to defend an, any president, any president, in a Senate impeachment trial? Bruce, Bruce Castor again. Video cut one. Play cut. House managers who spoke earlier were brilliant speakers. And I made some notes, and they'll hear about what I think about some of the things they said later when I'm closing the case. But I thought they were brilliant speakers, and I loved listening to them. And they're smart fellows. Okay, I'm going to get preachy now. Don't ever, if you are in a setting, whether it's a high school debate club or the most important trial of the century, the second impeachment of a president who happens to have left office. Don't sing the praises of the other team. How you love listening to them and how great they were. Unless, can you guess? Unless you're better than them. If you're going to crush them with your rhetoric, with your argument, with your evidence, with your style, with your tone, with your delivery. Then you can do it. Then you can risk it. Even then, not advisable. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. We already know that tech companies were interfering in the 2020 election significantly. Little did we know there was both private and public pressure to have the tech companies act as political referees to the benefit of Joe Biden and the Democrats. The most interfered with election in American history. Let me say that again. It was the most interfered with election in American history. From the private interests to the tech interests to the changing of how we do voting in this country. It was as if we have, it was the first election in American history because every election before it was done in completely different ways. But these tech companies have incredible influence over Congress. Triple eight nine seven one S A G E triple eight nine seven one seven two four three. I am Larry Elder. This means it is time for Can You Beat Kirk? We have two contestants: John, Houston, Mike, Pittsburgh. John, call first. John gets to go first. John, how are you? Hi, hi Larry. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure, John, and thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. John, you called first. You get to go first. The categories are This Week in the News, Sports, Famous Books, Car History, and Mexico. Where, John, would you like to start? Uh, um, let's do Mexico. Let's do Mexico. 
The flag of Mexico, John, consists of three broad vertical stripes in three different colors. Name the colors. Uh, red, white, and green with an eagle in the middle. Ouch. <laughs> Nicely done, sir. The score, the score <laughs> is one to nothing. John over Mike, and Mike wants to get on the court. John is determined to leave him off the field. The remaining categories, John. This week in the news, sports, famous books, car history. Where next? Uh, let's do um, this week in the news. Let's do this week in the news. John, President Trump, as you know, is being tried a second time for impeachment. The Democrat House members prosecuting the case against Trump are known as managers, of which there are nine. Who is the lead Democrat manager? Oh, that would be, um, can I use an adjective or just his name? <laughs> I need his name. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, in that case, it's Jamie Raskin. Okay. But I can add an ad adjective if you like. What, what's the adjective you would have used? Dirty. Dirty. What's the deal with his head in the back? At first, I thought that was a yarmulke. Is that just a ball spot? Uh, I don't know. I don't it's know. probably his light spot. I don't know what it is. It was the plate or something? I'm not quite. It's it just looked kind of weird. Okay. Uh, John, 2 nothing over Mike. Mike wants to get on the court. John's determined to keep him off. Sports. Famous books, car history are left. Where next, John? Sports. Sports. My man. In 2019, according to Forbes, she was the world's highest paid female athlete, raking in $37.4 million in prize money and endorsements. Who am I talking about, John? Um, Serena Williams. Negatron! All right, John, uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, I don't have a button at the bottom to put uh, John on hold. Can you do it? Because I can't do it with this little device we have here. So put John on hold, and then I'll bring in Mike. Michael, how are you? How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Mike, you're down, love, too. Let's catch up. According to Forbes in 2019, she was the world's highest paid female athlete, raking in 37.4 mil in prize money and endorsement. Who is the she I'm referring to? Venus Williams. Venus Williams. Yikers. Um, that's wrong. Uh, let's go back to uh, to John. Put uh, put Mike on hold and put John, pod John up. Okay. Put John back on. I'll do it. I think I got John back. Yeah, I got John. Okay, John. John and Mike, uh, the answer is Naomi Osaka. Uh, Venus is number two, oh and God. Naomi Osaka passed her up in 2019. So, it's still two to love. John, you were the last one to give a correct answer, so you still are in control of the board. We have two categories left. Famous books and car history. Where next? Oh, geez. Um, I guess famous books. Okay. All right, John. Leading 2 nothing. John's comfortable. What famous book begins with the following line? Call me Ishmael. What famous book begins with the following line? Call me Ishmael. Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf. Negatron. Let's uh, try to put John on hold without killing him. Can I do that? No, oh, I didn't do that right. You know, we just lost John. Let's go back to Mike. And maybe John will call back. John, please call back. John, please call back. 888-971-SAGE. 888-971-7243 is the number. Um, the category is famous books, Mike. And the question, one more time, is what famous book begins with the following line, Call Me Ishmael? Score is love two. What do you think, Mike? Uh, Captain Ahab. Captain Ahab, you're pretty close. Uh, Captain Ahab is a character in the book. I need the name of the book. Oh, oh, oh come on. I read this in high school. I know, God same here. Sake. Same here. Ah. Captain Ahab is, a, is the main character in the book, but I need the name of the book. Call me Ishmael. He was a narrator of the book. Oh, come on, brain work. Come on, me. Mike. Come on, Mike from Pittsburgh. Oh. Kicking our butts in the oh. 1970s. Pittsburgh versus the Steelers. I I'm still it. mad at you. I'm I still mad at Pittsburgh. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick myself. Mike, oh. it's, uh, Mike, Mike. The the beginning letter of the book is M, like that? Mary. How about that? Can I, can I add or no? 
M is the beginning uh, letter of the book. M like Mary. It's got two names. M like Mary. Its second name is D as in David. M D. Oh jeez. Oh jeez. Nope. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have to go back to John. Okay, uh, put John back on. Do we have John? I'm here. John, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Put John back on. My, okay, John, are you there? I'm, I'm here. Okay, John, I'm sorry about yes, it. Yes, sir, I'm I, here. I, I killed you before. That was my fault. John, you're still ahead to nothing. Uh, and uh, the answer, John and Mike, is the f- famous book that begins with the line, Call Me Ishmael, is Moby Dick by Herman Melville. The Moby last Dick, category yeah. now is car history. And, uh, and John, it's yours. In 1478, he sketched a primitive version of a self-propelled propelled car. Many people believe it is the first version of any car. 1478, he sketched a primitive version of a self-propelled car. Who is the he I'm referring to? 1478. Henry. Oh, jeez. Henry, Henry Ford? 1478. 1478. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, I can't remember. All right. Um, come on. 1478. That's Renaissance area. Uh, who who sketched stuff Renaissance area? What what Renaissance guy sketched things like cars, like parachutes, like wh- one of the four teenage mutant, mutant ninjas? You're going to hate yourself. Leonardo, give me another hint. Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, geez. Well, John, oh, doesn't, doesn't matter. John, okay. you won. Somebody give me an amen. Yes. I'm not, I'm not saying it was pretty, yeah. but it doesn't matter. John, you won two nothing. Very well done. Larry, yeah. So, John, stay can on the I line. Say something? Sure. Um. So, I wanted to say that there's a silver lining because you're parody and imitation of John Kerry has me rolling on the floor <laughs> and we have four more years of John Kerry <laughs> with the climate change so I'm, uh, I'm good well John thank you very much I appreciate it doing, doing John Kerry is not hard all you have to do is sound like all you have, all you have to do is sound like Lurch <laughs> <laughs> and my Maxine Waters I think is better I, 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 I don't go on shows like that of entertainers I, 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 I go on your show because because you're a serious journalist not to finally meet you too <laughs> my Jimmy Stewart, <laughs> Burt Lancaster. You want to hear those? Jimmy Durante. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. The impeachment trial will proceed. Dun dun dun. Big vote yesterday. That's one headline, USA Today. Huge font, trial to proceed. Chilling video, managers open by reviving riot. And then the vote was taken. 56-44, six Republicans joined with the Democrats in claiming that this show trial this snap impeachment is constitutional. Bill Cassidy, for some reason, out of the clear blue, last week he's on TV saying, oh, it's a show trial, doesn't mean anything, it's unconstitutional. But because he didn't like the performance of the president's lawyers yesterday, somehow he decided to vote suddenly that it was constitutional. But then again, that brings you to six Republicans, which means you're far short from the 17 Republican threshold to get a conviction. They've given away the ending. The vote yesterday sort of confirms that Trump will be acquitted, which will lead to the, the, the former president correctly claiming he's been vindicated. Certainly vindicated from an impeachment Uh, you know, claim that he incited an insurrection. I don't know how many times, how many places you can play this. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. So the Democrats claim that 
Trump saying, go peacefully, let your voice be heard or make your voice heard peacefully incites a riot and an insurrection. Great. Good luck with that. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Hugh Hewitt Show. I will not be persuaded where Justice Story wasn't persuaded and where the framers weren't persuaded that they really meant this and they just left it out. I mean, has anyone come up and and approached you with an argument yet that is even remotely plausible other than political? Well, that's a new uh, new way to cons- to interpret the Constitution. It's uh, what they left out, not what they put in. Uh, no, I mean, this is this is a made-up process. If this were the impeachment of a president, as you know, it required the Chief Justice to preside. And now we've got Senator Leahy, who is, will be the presiding officer. Presumably, he'll still act as a juror. Uh, Debbie Stabenow, the senator from Michigan, said, well, we're all victims. And then I assume we're, we're all witnesses, too. This is a... This is a Anglo-American jurisprudence turned on its head. Well, I have played your quote today because I think it's important that a condemnation of a pseudo-constitutional process not be confused with applause for what happened on January 6th. I believe the president was reckless right. that day, but that doesn't change the Constitution. And I, do your colleagues across the aisle acknowledge this at all? No, this is a political process. And, um, you know, Hamilton said as much in Federalist 65, as much as we try to analogize this to a a legal proceeding in a court of law, it's it's uh, it's unique. But it's clear that this is part of a continuum. Uh, A lot of the same impeachment managers served on the Judiciary Committee that that uh, tried uh, President Trump a year ago. And so uh, this has just been a continuum ever since he was sworn into office. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Hi, Larry. I have a question. You, about four or five months ago, you had the, uh, the guy, the history professor, on there talking about he went to the South did research and found out that black people own slaves. Why isn't that being just blasted over the airwaves from every talk show host? That's really going to cut the rug out from under Black Lives Matter and and systemic racism and stuff. Uh, That should be a major, major story. I'd like to hear it again. Thank you. 888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. I am Larry Elder. We are ReliefFactor.com studio. Next segment, we will be playing Phonebro. The historian to whom he's referring is Roger McGrath, who was a longtime historian at UCLA, and he wrote a piece about blacks who did own slaves. There weren't very many of them, but there were certainly black slave owners, quite a few in places like New Orleans. No, it's an uncomfortable uh, fact. It doesn't advance the agenda, nor does it advance the agenda to know that virtually no Republicans own slaves. There were a handful, a handful, out of all the slave owners who were Republicans. By the way, the woman that's been fired from Disney, Gina Carano, just announced a new movie deal with Ben Shapiro's Daily Wire. Quote, they can't cancel us if we don't let them, close quote, she says. Also on the election front, the Fox News personalities who are being sued by Dominion, Maria Bartiromo, Lou Dobbs, Judge Janine, Along with Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, they have filed a motion to dismiss the complaint. It's a it, their the uh, lawsuit against them was a 285 page, 2.7 billion dollar complaint, and they filed a motion claiming that what they said were in the bounds of the First Amendment protection, and that uh, the lawsuit ought to be dismissed. Again, we'll see what happens. As you know. The CEO and owner of Relief Factor, Mike Lindell, received a cease and desist letter, and he has not ceased or desist or desisted. So, my suspicion is that may get more serious. He says, "Bring it on." Now, the NAACP, the head of the NAACP, praised the job that Andrew Cuomo did on COVID. Now, his own secretary is admitting that they hid the numbers who died in nursing homes 
because they were afraid Donald Trump might prosecute him. They were afraid Donald Trump might put out a tweet saying he incompetently handled this. They were afraid of Donald Trump. And the media praised the job that Cuomo did. David, we're sitting by for Governor Cuomo's press conference, his daily briefing. How would you contrast Cuomo and President Trump's handling of the crisis? Truth versus mendacity. They wanted him to run for president. Governor Cuomo, um, out there day after day after day, everything. The secretary's apologizing. Apologizing of sorts. And she said, we, we, he, we, just, we had a meeting and, and he just starts tweeting referring to Trump that we killed everybody in nursing homes. And at that point, he said, we froze. We were in a position where we weren't sure we should give the information to the DOJ. We, we weren't sure if they were going to prosecute. We didn't know what, what to do. So we just didn't do anything. And we withheld the actual numbers. And she is now apologizing. Trump isn't honest, direct, brave. Real leadership of the kind the president of the United States should have provided. Governor Cuomo is clearly living in a totally different reality, the actual one, than the president of the United States. Governor Cuomo has become a national leader. For a lot of people, Andrew Cuomo has become the leader of the Democratic Party. He is conveying incredible strength. You spoke to National Guard troops today in a stirring speech that... Now, is he going to have to return the Emmy? NAACP CEO praising him, even though New York City, still a disproportionate percentage of the people contracting and dying from COVID-19, black and brown. Thank you, Governor, for your leadership. And, and Which, of course, the Democrats claim is, is systemic racism. You and good company of Hazel giving you a hard time should give both me and, and Al a hard time, uh, just to her nature. And I want to praise your leadership. Uh, you know, your leadership is something. I'm a sellout, though, right? Something to be modeled. Praising the leadership of a white man who's managed a coronavirus crisis that resulted in a disproportionate number of black and brown people dying from COVID-19, a situation that you guys have told us is, is, is systemic racism. And here you are praising this guy? And Al, a hard time, uh, just to hurt nature. Uh, you know, your leadership is something to be modeled by many states across the country. As we begin to educate our members and work with communities, uh, it is not lost on us that you jumped out early. Now, you know the officer who's been accused of murdering George Floyd. He was being guarded only by white corrections officers, according to a new lawsuit. Because they felt that the black officers might do something to him. So the black officers are ticked off. They said, we're professionals. We do our job. I've said before, how do you know what happened to George Floyd would not have happened to George Floyd had he been white or Hispanic? These guards are making pretty much the same argument. How do you know we can't guard this guy and do our job just because we're black? What is that? What are you saying? We're professionals. We're guards. They filed a lawsuit. So he's only being guarded by white guys because black guys can't be trusted not to kill him? What are you saying about the professionalism of the people that you hired? My goodness. And the black guys are upset about it. Pete and Seth Talbot, the father-son owners of Relief Factor, are on a mission. They want to double the number of happy customers in the coming year. Here's what I want you to do. Order the three-week quick start for only $19.95. If you're suffering from back, shoulder, hip, neck, foot, knee pain, whether from exercise or just getting older. Over 70% of the people who order it go on to order more. ReliefFactor.com, ReliefFactor.com, or call 800-4-RELIEF, 800-4-RELIEF. This is Albert Moeller for townhall.com. The American experiment is founded upon a presupposition, a prior commitment to an ordered liberty, an established order. That means policies. It means a covenant. In our case, it means a constitution. As of right now, the U.S. Constitution is the longest surviving written constitution in human history. It's a remarkable document. All of that came to the fore in violent events that interrupted the joint session of Congress to count the votes of the Electoral College. At the end of the day, our constitutional order proved itself once again resilient. But that doesn't take away any of the tragedy and the horror of what took place. It was an enormous stress test on ordered liberty, a stress test brought on by the President of the United States. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. 
It's an opportunity for the right, the left, conservatives, liberals, all Americans to repudiate political violence and reaffirm, once again, our commitment to ordered liberty. It's the American way. I'm Albert Moeller. The Pepperdine School of Public Policy, America's unique graduate program for leaders. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Burka. For an attorney, is there a job? Is there a job more important than this one? I mean, is it more prestigious than to defend an, any president, any president, in a Senate impeachment trial? Bruce, Bruce Caster again. Video cut one. Play cut. House managers who spoke earlier were brilliant speakers. And I made some notes, and they'll hear about what I think about some of the things they said later when I'm closing the case. But I thought they were brilliant speakers, and I loved listening to them. And they were smart fellows. Okay, I'm going to get preachy now. Don't ever, if you are in a setting whether it's a high school debate club or the most important trial of the century, the second impeachment of a president who happens to have left office, don't sing the praises of the other team. How you love listening to them and how great they were. Unless, can you guess? Unless you're better than them. If you're going to crush them with your rhetoric, with your argument, with your evidence, with your style, with your tone, with your delivery, then you can do it. Then you can risk it. Even then, not advisable. I'm too fast. Champion from the crib. I'm the king. Born to tell. Born to champ from the crib. Ah! I'm feeling great. I'm ready to go to war right now. I'm handsome. I'm fast. I'm pretty. And can't possibly be beat. I have tussled with a whale out of handcuffed lightning, throw thunder in jail. Now you know I'm bad. Only last week I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean I make medicine sick. 888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. That can only mean one thing, and that one thing is, it is time for a phone number. Kirk, what are the rules? Okay, Larry is going to play five sound clips from this week's show, and all you have to do is guess who's speaking. And if you can't guess, then you can ask for a clue. Phone a bro, and you'll get one of my world-renowned clues to help you get the answer. Now we have Ola, Omaha, Nebraska, versus Art Salem, Oregon. Uh, Ola, you call in first, so Ola, you get to go first if you choose to. Now remember, this is the last person standing contest. Whoever answers the fifth and final clue correctly wins, ir irrespective of what happened before then. So some people, Ola, like to have the opponent go first, hoping that he stumbles. Some people like to go first. It's up to you. I'll go you go first. I'll go first. Uh, by the way, is Ola a uh, a shortened name of a longer name? Yes, it is. Very long name. Because my, my mother's nickname is Ola. Her name is Viola. And my father always called her Ola. All of her relatives in the South, when we went down there, referred to her as Ola. You're the only other Ola I've ever talked to. Mine is, mine is Ola Takumbo. It's a Nigerian descent. Wow. What, what, what does it mean? It means wealth brought from abroad because I was born here in the U.S. Ah, nice. All right, Ola. Uh, you know the rules. Who's the first outside? one, you have to get on your own. You cannot get a clue. Uh, assuming you want to go first. Huh? Do you want to go first or do you want to let, uh, let your opponent okay. go first? I'll go first. Okay. Here's sound number one, Ola. In a moment, I will call up a resolution to govern the structure of the second impeachment trial. Sound bite number two. The Bill of Rights, Harris, is not meant to, it's not there to protect the high school quarterback or the prom queen. It's there to protect the unconventional, the singular. I'll play it again. 
the Bill of Rights, Harris, is not meant to... It's not there to protect the high school quarterback or the prom queen. It's there to protect the unconventional, the singular. Uh, he's a phone bro, if oh, I may. Sure. He is the senator from... I'm, I'm sorry, he's a senator from Louisiana, Republican. Yeah, I knew that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can only give you one hint. He's a Republican senator from the state of Louisiana. Uh, and and uh, same name as a famous president. How about that? Kennedy. Kennedy. Okay. <laughs> Now, Art, now, Art, don't get mad at me, Art. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be generous with you, too. Here is sound bite number three. Since you've exhausted your phone, bro, Ola, you have to get this one on your own. I can't help you. Here we go. Explicitly to Republicans, and they turn away. They can't make this math themselves. Yeah. They- it's not stupidity. I'm sorry. It's something way worse. This is evil. If you can't see what happened here... <sighs> I get it every Friday, but um, I guess I'm gonna. It's gonna have to be Art. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Art, are you there, sir? I'm here, Larry. Can you hear me? I hear you fine. Art, Art you don't sound very confident. Uh, I'll play the last clue well, again, and, and again, you can use well, a you can use a phone bro if you need one. Do you want to take a guess now? Um, I I I I can see her face. Well, no, I can't because I'm blind. But but I know the voice. But give me a, give me my phone, bro. bro okay, lady. okay. Uh, she is the co-host of Morning Jill, the show on MSNB uh, MSNB Hee Haw, and uh, her first name begins with an M, like Mary. Her last name begins with a B, like like uh, like Bravo. Yeah, and her husband's a creep. <laughs> well, well, that would that, that would have been t- one clue too many. So. So I held that one well, back. Well, no, I and and, and 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 by and by the way, Art, I mean, weren't they weren't they married to other people when they first started this show, and then they started a relationship, uh, and and they're now lecturing yeah. us about values and all this stuff. Anyway, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, well, he's he's kind of like Biden, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. So so you don't you don't you don't uh, you don't. Uh, I know it's Morning Joe, but. God, I can't remember the last name and stuff. And I, I see your face and the whole nine yards, Larry. Okay, all right. But okay, guess we, what? not a problem. Okay, uh, that that person is Mika Brzezinski. Uh, she's she's oh, a co-host. Yeah. I was going to say. So uh, now we're going to go to number four. You, you you've re- regained control of the board, Ola. You gave the last correct answer, so I'm going back okay. to you. Uh, and again, you can use a phonebro now. This is a new round if you need one. Here's the next clue. We're going to make sure that everyone has access to free community college and training programs. We're going to make sure students have the support they need to cross that finish line. And we're going to invest in programs that prepare our workers for jobs of the future. I can give you a hint if you need one. Yes, please. Yeah, because that, that's kind of, a, you, it's kind of a difficult uh, clue, although it's a very famous person. Uh, she is married to the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. She is the first lady. Oh, Dr. Dr. Jill. Dr. Biden. Jill. Okay, the good news is you're on the fifth and final clue, and if you get this one right, you win the contest. The bad news is you've exhausted your phone bros uh, in this one, so you have to get this one on your own. Are you ready, Ola? I am ready. By the way, Ola, I'm sure you are aware Nigerian Americans are the most prosperous of all black Americans in this country. I'm sure you know that. And about half of the yes. entering class of Harvard, about half of them are the black students are from the Caribbean or from uh, uh, from Africa, places like Nigeria. And you guys are doing better on SAT scores than many of the American born blacks are. So how can the SAT score therefore be culturally biased? But I stepped on your time. Here's your, I don't know. Here's your last one. Here we go, Ola. <laughs> I'm not sure how to, you know, respond to, you know, hypothetical questions like that. Um, you know, I hope everyone can, you know, uh, we're in this position like I am to, again, try to be the best I could be every day as an athlete, as a player, as a person in my community, for my team and so forth. So, Who is that person, Ola? <sighs> I know the question that they asked him. Oh, mm-hmm. Tom Brady. Whoa! Get out of here! Somebody give me a Hola, 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 hola. 
Nicely done. <laughs> I will not be persuaded where Justice Story wasn't persuaded and where the framers weren't persuaded that they really meant this and they just left it out. I mean, has anyone come up and and approached you with an argument yet that is even remotely plausible other than political? Well, that's a new uh, new way to construct to interpret the Constitution, it's uh, what they left out, not what they put in. Uh, no, I mean, this is this is a made-up process. If this were the impeachment of a president, as you know, it required the Chief Justice to preside. And now we've got Senator Leahy, who is, will be the presiding officer. Presumably, he'll still act as a juror. Uh, Debbie Stabenow, the senator from Michigan, said, well, we're all victims. And then I assume we're, we're all witnesses, too. This is a... This is a Anglo-American jurisprudence turned on its head. Well, I have played your quote today because I think it's important that a condemnation of a pseudo-constitutional process not be confused with applause for what happened on January 6th. I believe the president was reckless right. that day, but that doesn't change the Constitution. And I, do your colleagues across the aisle acknowledge this at all? No, this is a political process. And, um, you know, Hamilton said as much in Federalist 65, as much as we try to analogize this to a, a legal proceeding in a court of law, it's, it's, uh, it's unique. But it's clear that this is part of a continuum. Uh, a lot of the same impeachment managers served on the Judiciary Committee that, that uh, tried uh, President Trump a year ago. And so uh, this has just been a continuum ever since he was sworn into office. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Lon Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. The Biden administration announced in their first week that the U.S. is rejoining the World Health Organization. But the WHO is a flawed group, one that has performed poorly while the world has struggled with COVID-19. Early on, the group was far too deferential to China, even parroting Beijing's early claim that the virus could not be transmitted between humans. Since then, an independent panel concluded that the WHO dithered in its response, waiting too long to declare an international emergency. All the while, the WHO has continued to block Taiwan's participation because of political objections from the Chinese government, despite the fact that the world has much to learn from Taiwan's exceptional response to the virus. Before rejoining the WHO, we should have demanded some accountability and reform from the group for the $400 million in taxpayer dollars we send to it each year. It looks like we'll keep on writing blank checks to the WHO, which they are more than happy to keep cashing. I'm Lon He Chen. The Pepperdine School of Public Policy, America's unique graduate program for leaders. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.com. Play this because you don't play anything that disagrees with you, but your argument about black people creating more crime is flawed. You need to consider who gets to determine who commits crimes, and it is all white juries or majority white juries, okay? It's not black people committing more crime, it's black people being arrested for more crimes and white people not being arrested. Bet you won't play this. That's one of the dumber comments I've ever heard. Stats show overwhelmingly blacks at 13% are responsible for half of the homicides, 40% of the robberies, I mean, what, what an ignorant statement. These, these are facts. I know you don't like them, but they're facts. My goodness, how many studies have we had disproving that? Where are the lawsuits? Where are the class action lawsuits showing all of this abuse is taking place? Given what this gentleman just now said, there should be some very rich civil rights lawyers running around America. Where's the lawsuits? Cities like Baltimore, the police chief is black. The number two person behind the police chief is black. The mayor is black, all city council, uh, Democrats majority, uh, black. And this man is talking about the reason black people are arrested is because white people are, do are doing it, not because they're committing crimes. They're just minding their own business. They're just being snatched. How stupid is this? I used the word stupid today. I told you this line I, I saw in a movie called Superfly. Superfly is driving, and his passenger says to him, you know, you're really smart. And he says, 
it doesn't matter how smart you are in a world full of stupid blank blanks, end of quote. And I think we're producing more stupid blank blanks every day. AOC comes out of BU with a degree in economics. Are you kidding me? Now, I asked you which country worries you more, China or Iran. 91% of you said China. I have three questions for Zip this weekend. If you are white, do you have a close black friend? Yes or no. If you are black, do you have a close white friend? Yes or no. If you are Hispanic, do you have a close black friend? Yes or no. If you are an Asian American, do you have a close black friend? Yes or no. So, uh, one, two, three, these are four questions. In order to participate, you must be a member of the Zip community. Go to your app store and search under Zip Poll USA and be sure and use my code SAGE, S-A-G-E. Be sure and follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. And every morning I do what I call robe rage. In my robe, I rant about something for 59 seconds or less. I think you'll enjoy it. Also, be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Larry Elder Show Radio. And that way you'll be notified every time we post new videos. Did you know the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the team that won the Super Bowl, headed by Tom Brady, has one of the most diverse coaching staffs in the NFL? Four black coordinators. The assistant head coach, run game coordinator is black. The offensive coordinator is black. The defensive coordinator is black. Special teams coordinator, black. And what did the commissioner say? The fact that we only have two minority coaches out of the seven vacancies was not what we hoped. Resign. Point a black person as commish. Have a great weekend.